So can we start? About to start. So uh, very good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome all you. Uh, we welcome all of you to this uh, session on occasion of the World Obesity Day. So as you all are aware, we have an aging population. We have a population boom. We are also the diabetes capital of the world. And also we are seeing an increasing trend for rise in obesity among the young adults as well as adolescents. This is alarming, alarming because we know obesity is a very important cause, a risk factor for several diseases, several non-communicable diseases, right from heart disease, stroke, as well as to uh, cancer. And uh, preventing obesity is very, very important because obesity is a seat of inflammation and inflammatory disorders inside us. So today we have eminent speakers who have done a lot of research in the field of obesity using yoga and naturopathy approaches. And we are there here to share with us their research uh, findings from all the trials being done so far. So we have uh, very uh, famous speakers like Dr. Shelley Tellis, who is world renowned in the field of yoga research. We have Dr. Babina Nandakumar, who is the CMO of Jindal Hospital and has done a lot of work, primary work in using yoga and naturopathy in the management of obesity. We have Dr. Sujata Dinesh, who has done a study on using fasting and calorie restriction in management of obesity, looking at leptin and ghrelin mechanisms. We have Dr. Gyandeep, who is uh, from MSR Arogyalium, who is a young researcher and who's done a lot of work on using salt restricted diet and the role of salt restricted diet in management of obesity. And we also have Dr. Ravikant, who is a bariatric surgeon who is going to talk about management of obesity and how yoga and nationality can be an adjuvant with the conventional management of obesity as a bariatric surgeon. So we have some inter interesting topics and uh, we have interesting themes and uh, we hope to have a uh, very nice discussion on this particular subject today. And uh, I welcome all the speakers here who have spent their valuable time uh, to join us on this occasion. I'm sure their expertise and their lectures and oratorial skills will help in enthralling the audience as well as give us the required knowledge. I welcome you all once again. And I, I uh, Dr. Uh, we have uh, Sri Ranjit Kumar, who is our joint secretary. Uh, he has some technical glitch in joining. So uh, he, once he joins, we'll have him to, uh, give a few words of uh, encouragement to all the people here around us. I welcome all of you uh, for this particular uh, occasion. And uh, there's also a congratulatory note from uh, Sri Vikram Singh, who is the director of Ayush in the Ministry of Ayush as well. So with this, uh, I welcome all of you and over to Dr. Anusia to uh, take, the, take on the proceedings. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. On behalf of CCRN, I welcome you all for the technical session and uh, thank all the speakers for accepting our invitation for today's uh, webinar. Uh, with immense pleasure and honor, I would like to introduce Dr. Shelley Tellis, who is the most prolific and respected yoga researcher worldwide. And Dr. Shelley has did her uh, uh, MBBS uh, and uh, pursued her PhD in neurophysiology and yoga from National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Hans Bangalore. And Dr. Tellis has been the director of Patanjali Research uh, Foundation Haridwar India since 2007. And she was also the principal investigator at the ICMR uh, Center for Advanced Research in Yoga and Neurophysiology, Esbyasa, Bangalore from 2007 to 2012. As an author and co-author, she has published more than 140 articles in various journals with a remarkable number of citations of around 2,190 and over 18 book chapters and four books. Dr. Tellis received a Fulbright Fellowship in 1998 and in 2001, an award from the Templeton Foundation for Creative Ideas in Neurobiology. In 2007, she also received an award from Council of Medical Research for Advanced Research to study meditation's effect through autonomic variables, evoked and event-related potentials, polysomnography, and fMRI. Her areas of interest are mainly in the fields of yoga and neurophysiology, along with psychology, biochemistry, genetics, and molecular biology. Today, she is going to deliver her talk on role of yoga in the management of obesity. We request Dr. Shadi Tellis to deliver her talk. And please welcome, ma'am. Please. 
Okay. Greetings and uh, I congratulate the CCRN for choosing this topic and uh, really marking an important day in medical uh, treatments. Uh, so and I will be speaking on yoga for obesity and for that I will use some slides. I think, I'm sorry, I think the slides which are being shared has to be stopped being shared to permit me to share. Hello? Yeah, we can see your slides, ma'am. No, these, your are, slides. Yeah, these are not my slides. Oh, okay. Uh, guest four, uh, you are requested not to share your slides, please. We can share only one person at a time, so please uh, unshare yourself. Dr. Babina, please uh, stop sharing your slide, please. Uh, Dr. Babina, just go to the top of the screen next to that uh, mic button. There is a thing there that says stop screen share. Just click on that. Dr. Anasuya, can you please call her and yes, it's done, ma'am. Now you can share your slide. So is it visible to you all? Not yet, ma'am. Not yet, not yet, ma'am. Now? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Now? OK, yes, so uh, these are all sort of minor glitches which we can expect uh, as we go online, but consider the wonderful benefits we have. So yoga and obesity is something that we have been researching at PRF, Patanjali Research Foundation, ever since it was started in 2007. And we've done a number of studies conducted at our residential campus called Yogram, uh, which is a part, of course, of Patanjali Yogi, right from 2007 to 2016. Now, these were a range of studies, cross-sectional. We also had some uh, comparative control trials, a randomized control trial as well, and very short durations from seven days to a month. But even though the interventions were so short, we did feel that yoga was indeed effective for obesity in terms of reducing the body mass index, as well as uh, changing the waist circumference, which is an indicator of central obesity, and also, as the director has mentioned, changes in the uh, measures which indicate chronic inflammation. So there was work done which indicated there is an effect, but further work would be useful. At this point, that is around 2016, and as well as earlier, there were a number of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So I've got to mention one here, which was brought out by Losh and others, a different group of obviously from ours, uh, which was published in Preventive Medicine in 2016. Now, this systematic review and meta-analysis actually looked at three databases, Medline, Scopus, and the Cochrane Library. The criteria for including any study in this uh, systematic review was that the study had to be an RCT and or a cluster randomized trial. All participants who had any weight-related outcome investigated were included. And this could include overweight, obese persons, as well as, and this is very important, normal weight. There were no language restrictions, and only those trials which included overweight, obese persons who had comorbidities were excluded. So based on these criteria, the number of studies which were searched were 445, 445, and out of them, 30 trials were included, which incl uh, included or encompassed 2,173 participants. Now, from this, they drew certain conclusions about yoga and obesity, namely that if one includes obese, overweight and normal weight, there is no effect on weight related outcomes, including the weight, the body mass index, body fat and waist circumference. However, 
when this was uh, made much more refined, that is looking specifically at overweight obese participants, there was a very clear effect of yoga in reducing the body mass index compared to usual care or control. And this is very important because if a person is normal weight or underweight, they should not lose weight. And yoga is all about creating a balance. In people with normal weight, there was a change in the waist hip ratio. So with this background, systematic reviews like this, as well as our studies between 2007 and 2016, which were good, but had smaller sample size, not so ideal study designs and short durations of follow up. In 2016, we launched a nationwide campaign on the management of obesity through yoga. Uh, the study is still going on and in this year, that is 2021, we are hopeful to have the conclusion of the study. So what was this? This was a nationwide campaign which included 21 states and two union territories. The only states which really uh, we were not able to get adequate support from are shown in white here, like the northeastern states, though we had initially recruits from Manipur and we did have people from Kerala. In the final uh, analysis, we did not get these states to participate. However, since almost all other regions were included, we are able to make many other conclusions from the study, including uh, uh, generalizations and as well as specifics about the diet consumed in different regions, including the central region, the northern region, NCR, the eastern and western zones, and of course the southern states as well. So this was a study where we have included a wide range of assessments anthropometric of course which uh, can be measured with a measuring tape and a weighing scale as well as a more um, specific measure called the supine sagittal abdominal diameter which i like to mention in any presentation i do on obesity because this is a relatively inexpensive way using a particular tool which is relatively inexpensive but effective to assess visceral adiposity we also derived from these measures cardiovascular risk factor indices and measured the body composition, biochemical measures, especially the lipid profile, of course, the fasting blood glucose, measures of well being, like the muscle strength from different locations. And of course, it's needed to know how much the person is eating and how much they are spending energy expenditure through a international physical activity questionnaire and energy intake through their dietary call. I think we use 24 hour dietary call. Yeah. In addition to this, are people feeling better? What is their overall subjective feeling? So there is a very nice uh, questionnaire called the Bowhead Adult Questionnaire, which looks at different items of well-being in the quality of life. And uh, this is very specific for obesity and pre post testing. Normally it's done in relation to surgical assessments like this, like how good is a surgery for obesity? liposuction, gastric banding and others. But here, of course, we have used it in relation to yoga. We derived through the time that we looked at yoga for obesity, this 75 minute uh, package, which we believe is truly effective and it has all elements. You may say it acts at different kosha levels, uh, a universal prayer, different pranayama practices and postures or asanas in different positions. It ends with guided relaxation and though it is 75 minutes, this is not the reason per se for people finding it difficult to comply. However, there are other difficulties and I think that is the next slide. Yes, this gives you the two groups. So we had two groups. NA stands for nutritional advice and the other group was yoga. At the beginning of the trial, we recruited uh, by a, a part of our camps as well as other advertisements, 750 people in both groups. Uh, this was a large number at the time and we even had uh, equal numbers in both groups. However, even at the baseline, we noticed that the yoga uh, group were more 693, whereas 304. This was because right at the beginning, we asked people to state, are you able to be with us right through for 12 months without undertaking any other intervention and trying to comply with all our practices? And those people who were not able to agree that they would be able to do it dropped out even before we went into the baseline assessments and after that we uh, did not try to re um, recruit more people however you will see that the numbers 
uh, though they have steadily decreased, and this was largely not so much because people found it difficult to comply to the intervention, which was 75 minutes of yoga or nutritional advice, which actually uh, was a set of PowerPoints uh, which were made and this, uh, spent, sent to all the centers across the country for people to see every weekend. So both yoga and nutritional advice were weekend sessions throughout the 12 months where people would go to the respective area either to view these PowerPoints, which were all related to conventional nutritional advice covering macronutrients, vitamins, minerals, micronutrients and so on, as well as the yoga sessions where people were asked to practice with the yoga teachers three days in a week or at least one day out of Friday, Saturday, Sunday during the 12 month period. If people could not make it for six successive sessions, then they were dropped from the study, which is how we had a high attrition rate. But now actually we are very happy because we have some reasonable sample and we have a long follow up, which will allow us to, um, uh, as we have now processed the data, uh, may, uh, determine whether the conclusions, which I will be showing you in a few seconds, at three months hold good over six months, nine months and 12 months. So this is a very, what I'm going to show you is our initial data. Uh, yes, this is the very initial data at three months where we had the yoga and NA group, uh, just 26 people in each group, all of them females and followed up over a three month period. Here in this first slide, we have the anthropometric variables, the body mass index, the supine sagittal abdominal diameter, which is a very good indicator of visceral adiposity, cheap, but very effective, not ineffective, very effective. Yeah, there's the waist circumference and the hip circumference, all significantly reduced following yoga. Only two of them, the waist circumference and hip circumference, decreased following nutritional advice. So even though it was like a control intervention, we will see, and you can see in the successive slides, and this is true even at the subsequent follow-ups, nutritional advice does have a role as well. Other indices, and these are all derived. So the waist hips uh, ratio and a body shape index. Now both of these derived indices are very important because they are indicators of the risk, risk of what? Developing a cardiac event or risk of developing diabetes. And you can see that both these uh, reduced with yoga did not change with nutritional advice. There were other indices as well, like uh, abdominal volume index and body roundness. Both of these reduced with the uh, two interventions and in fact there was a greater reduction with uh, nutritional advice which shows you the importance of this intervention parallel with yoga. The lipid profile, uh, the only two markers changed, cholesterol and triglycerides and uh, here you can see from the y-axis that uh, you know this is the millimole per liter scale so where five millimoles per liter would be the cutoff. Neither group uh, yoga nor nutritional advice had abnormally high levels of cholesterol at baseline. There was no change in cholesterol or triglycerides and we continue to see a sort of similar um, trend as we go further into the follow-ups. A slight uh, but significant increase in cholesterol in the nutritional advice group which did not really follow through in subsequent uh, follow-ups. Now very important if we are seeing such benefits in terms of the anthropometric measures, what is really happening to the energy? So we find here that the energy intake and energy expenditure are almost comparable, not significantly different and not changing following either intervention after three months. So this is an indication that is not by making the person eat less and exercise more. Then how is it working? So this is very important to determine what is the mechanism. So when we get in fact, we want to know how it's working and then only uh, understanding about any of these uh, interventions like yoga or nutritional advice or physical activity or anything which is included in naturopathy other than uh, fasting and diet which and there are many possibilities how does it work is also a very important part of the acceptability and uh, use as an effective and safe practice so there are different ways one is is it because it makes the person feel better so if a person doesn't feel good about exercising they won't continue and this was a uh, part of the study that we did where we drew some data from uh, each group. Inclu uh, so we had 298 persons, uh, all of them obese. 
and uh, we had uh, yoga practitioners separate from yoga night on all dimensions of the more art health quality of life questionnaire the yoga practitioners scored higher than the yoga knife so they were better able to enjoy their physical activities work self-esteem had better social satisfaction and their overall quality of life too was better so this is a good indicator that people who practice yoga will be feeling better about themselves and hence not only start the weight loss program through yoga but they're also more likely to sustain it so this is one feel good sort of feeling and so the person is likely to continue what other mechanisms can one look at uh, here is a very important chemical called leptin which is an appetite suppressant so all our eating behavior occurs at the level of the hypothalamus so there is the lh and the vmh the feeding center and the satiety center and there are these chemicals like leptin adiponectin which have different effects on our feeding behavior and our satiety behavior leptin as mentioned in this slide is an appetite suppressant and if we continuously eat uh, extra food than we require then our appetite suppressant levels will be high so actually an indication of good eating behavior would be low leptin levels or at least leptin levels which are not high and here i have like this particular study very much which was done by a very prominent researcher in yoga janice kikold glazer published in physiology and behavior 2012 where uh, she has demonstrated that when you have 50 healthy females in each group novices to yoga and experts experts to yoga have predictably lower levels of leptin that means they do not periodically and repeatedly require leptin to suppress their appetite because they are eating correctly also have higher levels of another adipokine that is adiponectin where adiponectin has a very protective function present preventing uh, insulin resistance and even um, any other sort of problems like uh, including uh, risk of a cardiac event due to plaques and other things forming in the coronary vessels so what did we find we have measured both leptin and adiponectin and i think i have a slide uh, here is adiponectin levels where you see the ratio of adiponectin to leptin is higher in yoga experts same thing by janice kiko glazer and this was a trial yeah a randomized control trial where we had people randomized to yoga and walking groups the, the, this is part of our earlier pre uh, nationwide campaign where we had uh, 15 days follow up and very interestingly both yoga and walking have improved the leptin levels so the appetite suppressant is not low in uh, obese people it needs to be high so that is the distinction between Janice Kikol Glazer's work where she had looked at healthy people who need to have low leptin levels but in obese people, there's a need for the levels to rise because their eating behavior is not healthy. And so we see that uh, yoga and walking, though in walking it was not significant, are able to raise the leptin levels. And from this, we get many messages. We get that yoga improves the uh, BMI and other things by actually acting at fundamental imbalances in the feeding behavior. But not only that, that yoga can be uh, parallelly uh, uh, used as an intervention with other interventions such as correct nutritional advice and that is indeed something that you can definitely draw from naturopathy as well as physical activity in general like walking so if an obese person wants to correct their diet very good they will be looking at a fundamental imbalance if they can walk more than use transport uh, motorized transport very good and add to that yoga, there is every indication that they will uh, be very healthy. And then this brings me to the summary. I really don't want to overshoot my time. So we see that yoga is effective. And this is even more so as we look at by June this year, bringing up the publications which look at the whole um, range of follow up from three months right up to 12 months with three month intervals in between. Yoga is effective. So 
just as we found from our initial studies, as it was shown in the systematic review and meta-analysis, we can conclude that definitely yoga is effective to reduce the body mass index, the supine sagittal abdominal diameter, which is a good indication of visceral adiposity, the waist circumference and the waist hip ratio in people who need to reduce it. That is people who are overweight and of course people who are obese. And this is not necessarily by changes in the EE, EI balance. So it doesn't mean that a person needs to starve and exercise like anything. So it can be done by keeping the energy balance within normal, which is very important. On the other hand, uh, there are other mechanisms at play here, including psychological factors, which makes the person feel good and is likely to sustain their uh, weight loss program through yoga and balance in the adipokines, in the leptin, adiponectin and so on. And finally, I also want to mention that yoga can be very effective when it's combined with other methods. There are so many options in naturopathy, uh, good diet. So I'm sure that will be covered in the course of this interesting webinar, as well as physical activity in general. So with that, I say thank you and I will come up. Uh, very much, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, sir, uh, director, sir, would you like to join in between? Ma'am, I would like to speak to you, but uh, once in between, I think uh, director needs to introduce the JS. Uh, sir? Sir, you are on mute. No, no, no. Okay, uh, okay. am I audible? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Yes, Shari, for uh, for this eloquent uh, lecture. Uh, now I take the honor of uh, introducing uh, our Joint Secretary P. N. Ranjit Kumar, who has been the man behind the show. Uh, he is the one who has uh, helped us to launch this ABCC platform uh, to start these online webinars across all the councils and all the national institutes. I welcome uh, Sri Ranjit Kumar uh, to this uh, occasion, sir. So please, sir. Dr. Rao, thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, hearty good morning uh, to all the uh, esteemed panelists and uh, other friends, as well as the uh, viewers uh, who have joined us uh, for this very important uh, uh, webinar uh, on a, a subject of uh, a national as well as uh, a global importance. Uh, I start with an apology, you know, uh, of late it is becoming customary. Uh, some of us uh, are still uh, technologically challenged. I had some issues in uh, logging in, uh, so got delayed. Uh, <clears throat> very, very uh, happy from the side of the ministry to see uh, this uh, discussion uh, taking off. Um, obesity, uh, uh, you know, we all know this uh, description of uh, diabetes as a silent killer, uh, but uh, the grim fact is that obesity is not uh, far behind. Uh, the silver lining in this is certainly uh, practices like uh, yoga, uh, which help uh, the common man uh, to address uh, the issue, um, uh, you know, uh, with uh, very limited investment, uh, very limited uh, 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 planning or preparation, uh, very limited resources. Practically, all you need is a will uh, to take up the appropriate uh, yoga protocol. But then uh, is uh, are we claiming that uh, yoga provides a foolproof solution? Not yet. Uh, this is actually not about claims. Uh, this is about uh, helping people. Uh, this is about placing uh, solutions uh, before those who need them. And uh, along with the solutions uh, today, uh, uh, like uh, what we uh, saw in the, in the presentation, which I just concluded, so along with presenting these solutions today, thanks to uh, uh, inputs of rigor uh, like the one we just saw, uh, we are able to also present facts, uh, evidences which uh, uh, stand the scrutiny of uh, modern scientific practices also before the public. Uh, and then uh, uh, we are adding to uh, solutions. At the same time, we are confident of uh, their efficacy. So this is uh, this is excellent and uh, uh, in many ways, uh, in uh, 20, um, uh, 2014, uh, when we uh, moved into, uh, uh, you know, our own ministerial setup, uh, the objectives 
which were uh, envisioned at that time included uh, activities like this. Uh, uh, activities which uh, focused on uh, Ayush solutions, including yoga, of course, um, and uh, developing them and placing them on their own footing, uh, their own uh, their own feet, uh, so that uh, uh, they could uh, start a journey on their own. Uh, so uh, the, the ministry uh, takes pride in the fact that uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, so many of such initiatives uh, um, could be fueled. Uh, you know, they could be powered uh, in terms of uh, resources, in terms of uh, giving them sanctity, authenticity, um, and uh, uh, allowing them uh, to uh, find their own space in the uh, world of healthcare. So uh, that way, uh, uh, these uh, webinars and uh, uh, the facts they bring out, uh, the, the case studies, uh, the evidences, uh, and also that uh, on one side, uh, these are coming out and on the other side, the interaction with the public is facilitated. So uh, uh, this way, uh, uh, the point I was making was that it's a moment of satisfaction for the ministry that uh, some of the goals with which uh, the ministry was set up are already being fulfilled. Uh, and uh, researchers, uh, medical luminaries uh, across the spectrum, uh, not just from yoga or Ayush, but uh, uh, more importantly from modern medicine, uh, who have been contributing to this effort. Uh, they are our uh, stakeholders and the ministry uh, is, uh, uh, you know, without any um, Conditionalities. The ministry is get grateful uh, for these efforts, and uh, uh, hope uh, that we can forge partnerships. Uh, it's important to formalize uh, many of these partnerships because only when uh, partnerships and systems are formalized, they sustain. So, uh, in the next stage, uh, that is uh, what uh, uh, the ministry is uh, looking forward to. And uh, the uh, one of the arms uh, for the ministry for that will be uh, CCRYN. So uh, with this uh, late entry, I don't want to take uh, much time. I want to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Raghavendra Rao for this uh, initiative. Uh, he has given a shape uh, to uh, the webinar and uh, I can see that uh, uh, this structure, uh, it is actually, uh, the, it has a vision that goes uh, beyond uh, the webinars uh, into various uh, activities. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, exciting for the ministry to see that. And uh, uh, like uh, the support uh, for all this will continue. Uh, I need not even state that. And I once again thank all the listening. Uh, uh, we are uh, really grateful uh, for this uh, support. Uh, and also uh, we would request request uh, that uh, uh, keep an eye for, like I said, uh, for um, uh, forging and uh, formalizing partnerships uh, at the individual level and uh, more so at institutional level. Uh, the ministry is not uh, uh, just open to it. Uh, the ministry keenly welcomes it. The ministry is looking forward to such opportunities. So uh, uh, all the esteemed panelists and, and other experts who are joining us, uh, let us uh, uh, take this journey forward. Uh, through uh, formal partnerships and uh, um, uh, more involvement. So thank you so much. Uh, I wish uh, the event uh, the best. Uh, I will uh, uh, continue to listen in, uh, but I don't want to come in the way of uh, experts and uh, their audience. Thanks once again. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you for your modest words, sir. And uh, yeah. your words are truly encouraging for the Nashpati community and also the researchers here. And uh, we are sure we're going to live up to your expectations, sir. And I thank the Ministry of Ayush for supporting us for this webinar. Uh, thank you once, once again, sir. And uh, Dr. Nishri, I think we can go with the proceedings. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and uh, before we move on to the another speaker, if possible, can I connect with uh, Dr. Shirley Tellis in this? Yeah, please. Ma'am, uh, are you uh, are you there, ma'am? Hello, are, are you there? No, she is not. Okay, okay, she has left. Okay, okay. Then let's. Okay, okay.
Now moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Babina Nandakumar. She did her BNYS from SDM College of Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences. She has around 23 years of clinical experience and is currently the Joint Medic Chief Medical Officer at Jindal Nature Cure Institute, Bangalore. She has also been the principal investigator for most of the research projects. She is actively involved in research and clinical practice of naturopathy and yoga and published over four research papers. She has presented her work in various yoga and naturopathy conferences and also authored four books. She was known for her various health talks on social media channels and has an enormous contribution with her articles on naturopathy and yoga to various magazines. She is also the editor of Health Herald magazine of Jindal Nature Cure Institute. Please welcome Dr. Babina to deliver her talk on a role of naturopathy in the management of obesity. Please welcome Dr. Babina. Namaskar and good morning to all. Good, good morning, ma'am. Yes. So now today I'll be speaking about the role of naturopathy in treating obesity. Obesity is a medical condition in which excess body fat has accumulated to the extent that it may have a negative effect on health. Dr. Babina, can you make it a full screen? Is yeah, it? Yeah, now it is full screen? Uh, now it. You need to go to the original screen and make it full. Um, it's not in the present slides. Uh, you know, you have to uh, go and present uh, present the slides. You know, we are we can see the left side also. So go to the uh, PowerPoint no, presentation. Okay. No, no, uh, Babina, go to the yeah. PowerPoint presentation, which is there on your desktop. Make that okay. full screen there. It will come full screen. Full screen. Full screen. It is. No, here you can here you can't change it. Okay. You just minimize this. Go to the desktop where you have the PowerPoint, which wherever you are. Uh, Showing the PowerPoint from. Go to the file and make the full screen now. Crowd, it has to become present slides. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is it okay now? Uh, no, man. Just go ahead. No problem. So now first we will see what is the definition of obesity. Obesity is a medical condition in which excess body fat has accumulated to the extent that it may have a negative effect on health. So obesity is a complex disorder of the modern world. It is defined as an abnormal increase in weight of the body above the desirable level caused due to the generalized deposition of fat. So obesity is the result of an imbalance in energy intake and energy expenditure. So whenever we burn less calories, then definitely we tend to put on a lot of weight. The intake of calorie has to be less and the output of calorie has to be more. Only when we create that imbalance in the energy, only then there will be weight loss. So now we will see for the types of obesity. Apple shaped obesity. So as the name itself says, it is a big waist. The person who are having this apple shaped obesity will have a big waist and, it, and the tendency to gain weight on the abdomen. And the pear shaped obesity, they have smaller waist and carry their extra pounds in, on the hips, thighs and buttocks. So causes of obesity, excessive food intake, lack of physical activity, genetic susceptibility, endocrine disorders, medications. Ma'am, your slides I'm are not moving. Mental illness, it's not moving? No. No, they were frozen. No? No, ma'am. The slides are not moving. No. Kindly reshare the slides. Go to stop screen, uh, stop sharing, and then again reshare it once again. Babina.
just stop sharing uh, Babina again. You will reshare once again. Uh, Dr. Anushuya, can you please take over? She's not able to yeah. share. They're not able to see. What is the problem, Dr. Rajendra? You're not able to. No, no, no your slide is not able. moving. Slide is not moving. Just stop the screen share. Now it's moving. Is it moving now? No, 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 stop the screen share, right? No, but we know you ask them to make the PowerPoint presentation you know, on the slide show up mode and then you share. She's doing it. Yeah. Now can you see it? Yeah. Now is it OK? It's not full screen. Try to make it full screen. Go to the presentation and make it full screen. Yeah, now it's full screen. Now? Oh, it's not coming. Can you move the slide, Jesse? You have changed. No, it's not showing. It was talking not... complications of obesity slide only. Types of obesity. The next slide is not showing. This one? No. Madam, Causes you can do obesity. one thing. You can press F5 button. F5 button, yeah, F5 it will move. Yeah, we have done with the F5 only. Oh, it's not, okay. It's your phone only. Uh, Dr. Babina, while when you are sharing it, there might be two screens of a PPT. Can you just scroll down a bit and see there might be one more screen which you can share. That is that that would be full screen. Now it is moving. So if you can just check. Now it uh, is moving. Yes. 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 yes, it is moving. So now yes. you can continue with the slide where you left. Okay. Hmm. So the causes of obesity is excessive food intake, lack of physical activity, genetic susceptibility, endocrine disorders, medications and mental illness. So now we will see for the complications of obesity. So obesity leads to the imbalance in the hormones in our body. So that leads to hormone dependent tumors. And the second Complication of obesity is increased free fatty radicals or acids. So that leads to metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, hypertension, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and various cardiovascular diseases. And the mechanical stress of the obesity is sleep apnea, osteoarthritis, low back pain, and shortness of breath dyspnea because of the obesity and excess weight gain. So technical defi definition of obesity is body mass index. This is the most accepted unit for defining obesity. So BMI is calculated by weight by height square. So BMI up to 18.5, we consider it as underweight. And 18.5 to 25, it is considered as normal weight. And 25 to 30, it is considered as overweight. And 30 to 35 as class 1 obesity. 35 to 40 as grade 2 obesity. And above 40, it is the morbid obesity or the grade 3 obesity. So how to manage obesity in naturopathy? So the successful obesity management requires identifying and addressing the root causes of weight gain. That is where naturopathy plays an important role. Because in naturopathy, we believe that accumulation of toxins is the root cause for all diseases. So once the toxins are accumulated in your system, it creates lots of disharmony in the function of your body, and that leads to different types of diseases. So when you come to naturopathy, we give various types of treatment to detox and rejuvenate your system. So once you detox and rejuvenate your system and then go back on a healthy diet, then definitely you can lose a lot of weight. And all the treatment plans should be realistic and sustainable. That is very important in the modern era because many people 
look for quick fixes and crash diets. So all that is only temporary. Only when you're on that diet plan, you tend to lose the weight. And once you get back to your original routine, again you tend to gain all the weight back. Treatments. So the main treatments in naturopathy, we emphasize on diet because diet itself is your medicine. And various naturopathy treatments, we give like cold hip bath, mud pack. If the weather is favorable, you can take the cold hip bath. Otherwise, in the cold temperatures, you can go for the neutral hip bath. 15 to 20 minutes is advisable every day. Oil massage, different types of oil massages you can take, like the deep tissue massage, salt glow therapy, hot stone massage, chirally massage. All these things help to improve your metabolism, improves your blood circulation, your lymphatic drainage, venous drainage, which helps in reducing your weight. Steam bath and sauna bath also increases your basal metabolic rate and helps as an adjuvant in losing weight. Warm water immersion baths with Epsom salt, like the neutral half bath with Epsom salt, neutral immersion bath with Epsom salt, graduated immersion bath with Epsom salt, underwater massages, deluxe hydrotherapy, jacuzzis, all these things also helps in mobilizing the fat. Warm water enema regularly for the first two, three days of fasting and thereafter every alternate day during the extend, extended period of fasting is very beneficial. And colon hydrotherapy is also very essential to improve your metabolism and to detox your system completely. Because constipation is the mother of all diseases. So once your body is filled with the toxins, whatever dieting and exercising you do, that will not have a good impact on your system. But whereas once you detox your system and then go back on the healthy diet, that will help a lot in reducing your weight. Exercises, different types of exercises like walking, jogging, swimming, aerobics, gym, all these things helps in reducing the weight. And yoga, as Dr. Shelley Tellis has explained it, yoga is also very effective in losing weight. So diet therapy is the cornerstone of treatment for obesity. So the main do's what you have to do to reduce weight is eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, drink eight to 10 glasses of water and follow the food timings. That's very, very important. And you should not snack in between the meals. And rich desserts, fried foods, sweets, chocolates, alcohol, non-veg, all these things have to be avoided completely. And taking a lot of medications, even for minor ailments, has to be avoided. So always there should be a balance between the calorie input and the calorie output. So only when the calorie input is less, and the output of calories is more, you tend to lose weight. Otherwise, if it is the other way around, then you tend to increase your weight. So modifications in diet is very, very important. So what to eat? Eat a lot of food which is rich in high fiber and antioxidants. And how much to eat is very important. So you should fill your stomach only with half portion with the solid food and the quarter portion you can fill it with the liquids and the other quarter portion should be left empty for the proper mixing of the food with the acids. So like a mixie, you cannot stuff your stomach till the brim so that there will be not pulverization of your food. But same thing happens with our stomach as well for the proper mixing of the food, you have to leave your table when your stomach is filled to the three-fourth. And how many times to eat is very important. So eating twice a day is ideal. You can have a brunch in between 10.30 to 12 o'clock. And then again in the evening, you can have your dinner between 5.45 to 7 o'clock in the evening. 
this would be the ideal time. And why to eat? We have to eat to live, but not live to eat. And when to eat is also very important. You have to listen to your body, not just going by the time. It's, that, it's not that it's one o'clock, uh, so I have to have my lunch. You have to wait for the real appetite, and only at that point of time, it is better if you have your food. And you have to eat your food by chewing properly. That is the reason we have a saying in naturopathy that drink your solids and eat your liquids. That means you have to chew your food at least 72 times for the better absorption of the food what you eat. So food is the fuel of body machine. So eat to live, but not live to eat. The person who knows that how much and when to eat lives definitely for a longer time with good health. Eat wholesome fruits and vegetables. Eat two meals a day and fasting once in a week is very important. So what is fasting? Fasting is langanam paramaushadam, that is abstinence from food is the supreme cure. So now we will see what naturopathy treatments are beneficial. Like you can have a look, we, we can practice at home towel pack or jelly pack. Because mud pack, it is very difficult to practice at home. This can be given in the naturopathy hospitals. But for the patients who want to reduce weight and suppress their appetite, they can do the towel pack. They can just take the turkey towel, dip it in the ice water, and then keep it on the abdomen for 15 minutes in the morning for empty stomach. And even the jelly pack can be kept in the deep freezer for 15 to 20 minutes and then kept on the abdomen. Abdominal pack in the night is very, very helpful. Either you can take it one half before dinner or two halves after dinner. Even the leg pack, thigh pack, arm pack, if you want to concentrate on particular regions to reduce the weight, these packs are very important. And even just by targeting the areas where the fat has to be reduced will not be that helpful when there is not complete detoxification of your system. So for that, kidney pack is very essential because it helps you to tone your kidneys and it is a very good diuretic. So it helps a lot in the water retention. And the gastrohepatic pack, liver being the biggest excretory organ in your body, it is good to stimulate the liver to keep your weight under control. So GH pack also can be practiced at home at least weekly twice. And nature cure treatments like as I mentioned, hip bath, immersion bath, hydrotherapy treatments are very good for reducing the weight and oil massages, even the vibro massage that we give with the rice powder and different vibrators are fitted in it. That is also very good for reducing the weight. And even the partial massages targeting on different areas gives a very good effect. So remember, successful obesity management requires realistic and sustainable treatment strategies. Short term, quick fix solutions, focusing on maximizing weight loss, are generally unsustainable and therefore associated with high rates of weight regain. That is very bad. So until and unless you maintain it, there cannot be any miracles happening. So that is the reason even practicing fasting once in a week is very ideal to continue the weight loss and also it enhances the body metabolism. So even after breaking the fast also, one should follow the low calorie and high fiber diet till they attain their desirable goal. So obesity management is about improving heart and health and well-being and not simply reducing numbers on the scale. So the success of obesity management should be measured in improvements in health and well-being rather than in the amount of weight lost. For many patients, even modest reductions in the body weight can lead to significant improvement in health and well-being. 
so when you lose weight that will make you more confident so that you look good feel good and live good in jindal naturopathy hospital we have conducted a research study on obesity so obesity is considered to be an important risk factor for various comorbidities like cardiovascular disorders insulin resistance inflammatory diseases naturopathy and yoga therapies are frequently used for weight reduction by obese and overweight individuals this study was carried out to evaluate the effect of in patients naturopathy and yoga management of obesity in this study data was collected from 2671 obese individuals their bmi being about 25 who took naturopathy and yoga therapies in jindal nature cure institute for a minimum period of 15 days changes in body mass index fat mass fat percentage and lipid profile was analyzed before and after the intervention values of the variable at baseline and post intervention were compared using independent samples test so after interventional period significant reduction was seen in the in the means of bmi the p value being less than 0.001 ldl also showed a significant relief and triglycerides fat mass fat free mass fat percentage total cholesterol and also there was a significant increase in the high density lipoprotein so triglycerides and li low density lipoprotein was brought down drastically whereas the high density lipoprotein was increased so the conclusion is that naturopathy and yoga therapies seem to have a considerable effect in management of obesity and can be considered as an important non pharmacological approach in treating obese patients beneficial effects were seen to be decreasing with increase in age suggesting use of nature cure interventions at an earlier age so naturopathy method helps you to change your lifestyle it helps fight the root cause of the problem than just dealing with the problem it's safe and a healthy way to lead a disease free life thank you very much uh thank you very much dr babina and uh, the lecture was very practical way of explanation for even the methods which can be used at the uh, at home also you have explained it very nicely and one more thing when people uh, stay at the home whether people have a question like one has to take the cold shower or the hot shower at home that may help in maintenance of the weight so what do you suggest in that one it is always better if the patient uh, with the if the patients take a cold shower because cold shower is always stimulate you and it increases the vital capacity of each and every organ in your body but whereas when you take a hot shower it may be pleasant for that moment but it is very exhaustive see once you take a cold shower you feel like going and taking a nap but whereas when you take a cold shower it stimulates your entire system and you feel vigorous and good vitality is there throughout the day Oh, very good, very good. And taking clue from the slides of uh, Dr. Shelly Tellers, what she has done uh, told us leptin and ghrelin, and actually the two hormones uh, that have a major influence on the energy balance. And see, in the uh, recent studies, what they have found is even in obese individuals, the leptin is increased and the ghrelin is decreased, and still the weight loss is not happening. And the findings suggest that obese individuals are actually leptin resistant. so uh, even in another study it was shown that leptin is positively correlated with the serum insulin in the plasma glucose levels and suggesting that insulin and glucose may play a role in the regulation of leptin release and even in the leptin uh, resistance also so with relevance to these other findings can you please share your thoughts on the role of yoga or the naturopathy in uh, leptin resistance yeah we had conducted a short study about this also that is the role of naturopathy and yoga combined with the diet so in that we have got very good results i think the, the combination of the diet and uh, treatment and the yoga therapies work instead of only doing the yoga therapy or only the diet therapy or only the naturopathy so we had combined all these three things together and we have got good result in that i think with the patients who are really fighting with obesity naturopathy yoga and diet combined together will definitely benefit them oh thank you very much thank you very much
And the other thing is even uh, in our uh, nature care hospitals and all, most of the time we will be just assessing the BMI. So uh, for just weight loss, even the studies are show that there is a reduction. There will be a reduction in the BMI levels. But once you see critically, there is a disadvantage that the BMI does not distinguish between a muscle from the fat tissue as well. And it will not differentiate from the central and the peripheral obesity also. So can you please highlight on that the peripheral uh, and the visceral fat, the subcutaneous fat and the visceral fat uh, with the naturopathy treatments? How does yeah, it affect? Definitely. That is the reason we use the body fat analyzer where not only the BMI is there, we have the fat percentage, fat mass, fat free mass and the total body water. So when the patients come to us on the day of admission, we do a body composition analyzer which shows all these parameters. I know, and even on the day of discharge, after giving all the, our naturopathy, yoga and diet treatments, we do it again on the day of discharge so that you know there is a good comparison result. So that is the reason we are not only concentrating on the BMI or the number and even we do the blood test also because on admission also we do their lipid profile and everything. So even on the day of discharge also in my study also I've shown that there is a good improvement in the total cholesterol, triglycerides, lowering of the LDL and increase of the HDL. So even uh, naturopathy or uh, the Jindal Nature Pro Institute also, we also just don't run behind the number or the obesity or only the BMI. We try to give the overall well-being to the patients. So with all these parameters and practice, we give them the comparative results on admission as well as on discharge. Okay, in, uh, in some of the nature care hospitals, generally the trend is giving the low salt diet and uh, salt-free diet is being prescribed in some of the hospitals and they're, they're assuring good results with that. So what is your take on it? No, I don't advise to go on a salt-free diet. See, in naturopathy, what we believe is it should be sustainable. That is very important. Maybe for a short period of time to detox and rejuvenate, it is okay. But when the patients go back home, nobody can, re uh, can restrict themselves to a salt-free diet. So that is the reason we say that whatever we use, it should be in the limited quantity which will act as a medicine because excess of anything is poison. So using Senda Namak and the pink Himalaya salt in the required amount, depending upon the patient's condition, we prescribe in Jindal also and we expect the patients to follow it up at home also to be more practical. That was very fine. That was fantastic. And thank you very much, Dr. Babina. Thank you for your wonderful explanations in the detailed uh, manner. Thank you very much. Now let's move thank on to. Much. Thank you. Now let's move on to uh, next speaker, Dr. Sujata Dinesh. Yeah. Are you there, Dr. Sujata Dinesh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good. But, uh, very good morning. So, Dr. Sujata Dinesh is a naturopathy physician and yoga therapy consultant. She is the dean, division of natural therapeutics, and professor and HOD in the department of hydrotherapy. She did her BNYS from SDM College of Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences and MSc Yoga from Svyasa University. She has over 25 years of teaching and clinical experience in SDM College and Hospital in Dharmasthala. She is known for her experience in holistic health streams like yoga, acupuncture, physiotherapy, acupressure, diet and nutrition, hydrotherapy. She was also awarded with Vashista Award and Madan Mohana Award in 2005 by Svyasa University. She has published over 33 research papers and presented her work in various naturopathy conferences. Today, she is going to deliver her talk on role of fasting and calorie restriction in obesity. So, uh, welcome Dr. Sujata Dinesh. Please share your slides and start your session now. Namaste. Yeah, so I'm going to share my slides now. Yes. The study which we have conducted uh, it is on comparing the effects of short term fasting therapy and low calorie diet on anthropometric and leptin measures among obese or overweight persons. It was a randomized controlled trial being conducted in our hospital and it is being published in uh, Ancient Science of Life in uh, May, uh, May month 2020 issue. This is the abstract which you can see in the paper and I will be going to the introduction as such. The incidence of obesity and overweight, it is uh, globally, it is around, obesity is around 600 million and overweight is around 1.9 billion uh, among adults and it has been doubled since 1980. This is the estimation in uh, 2014. So the 
figures might have changed by now. The prevalence in India about the obesity, we can just say that uh, among the males it is 13.9 percent, and among uh, among among the females it is 13.9 percent, and among males it is 11.1 percent. So the prevalence of obesity, especially in India, it is more in females. Coming to the etiology, as uh, Babina Madam had already said, the obesity is uh, connected with the genetic, environmental, and psychological factors. Even then, the excessive intake of high-calorie diet and lack of physical activity is the main cause of the cause for the obesity. And the pathophysiology of the obesity, as it is rightly put in uh, by the uh, discussion right now, it has a connection with the leptin also so so when we just the yeah. slides were not I moving want, yeah 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 so uh, we have thought that the naturopathy and yoga can help with its treatment modalities and therapeutic fasting and raw diet therapy. And we wanted to compare the naturopathic therapeutic fasting and the naturopathic based raw diet therapy. So the reason for taking up this particular uh, study is that there was no prospective study for establishing the effect of naturopathic principle based therapeutic fasting and low calorie diet in obese and overweight persons till date. So we have hypothesized that a 10 days of fasting therapy would result in a significant changes on leptin and anthropo anthropometric measurements on obese and overweight persons than the naturopathic low calorie diet group. So the aim of the objective, aim and objectives of this study is to uh, aim is to compare the naturopathic fasting therapy with low calorie diet on obese and overweight persons. The objective is where the comparison was done by taking the anthropometric measures and serum lifting. The study participants were the inmates of SCM Yoga and Nature Cure Hospital Dharmasala, that is Karnataka. And inclusion criteria is BMI more than 25 uh, kg per meter square according to WHO criteria. The age is between 18 to 40 years and we have selected those people who are uh, going for fasting for the first time. So we called them as fasting nine and uh, we, we did not include so, so included those people who are under hormonal medication and at least for the past two months. So exclusion criteria we can just say the morbid obesity was excluded, drug induced obesity was excluded, the endocrine disorders such as hypothyroidism and polycystic ovarian syndrome was excluded, uncontrolled hypertension, hypercholesteremia, type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus was also ex excluded and uh, we did not include the uh, substance use disorder uh, patients and we did not include females during menstruation, lactation and pregnancy. Coming to the materials and method, the sample size was calculated using G-Power software accounting for a larger effect size 0.8 and significance level 0.05 with a confidence of 95% and attrition rate of 5%. So we got the sample size as uh, 88, that is N uh, in each group N is equal to 42. The ethical committee approval was taken and informed and signed consent was obtained. We had gone for randomization and uh, we blinded the uh, personnel who could uh, collect the blood. The design of the study is a single centered, single blinded, randomized control trial. So we will go for the trial profile here. So after applying inclusion and exclusion criteria, we have recruited 88 people and they were randomized into fasting therapy, which is based on naturopathic principles and 
diet low calorie diet group which is also based on naturopathic principles and uh, we could see that in fasting therapy there were two drop offs because of the illness during the fasting so data analysis was done for 42 patients in fasting therapy and in naturopathy and diet control group we had two drop offs who could not complete the 10 days of uh, low calorie diet uh, session so we had data analysis for 42 patients here why do we say naturopathy fasting therapy the uh, here i would like to say about the highlights of naturopathy fasting therapy as such so we wanted to keep people in the uh, our hospital away from their routine and we wanted to assure them complete physical and mental rest the supervision of naturopathy and uh, yoga physician was uh, you know it was very much compulsorily uh, going on in our hospital and uh, we asked the people to remain hydrated by drinking at least 3 liters of water especially during uh, juice fasting and no other supplementary diet was given in any moment and we asked them to go for yoga relaxation technique such as deep relaxation technique and we also asked them to have minimal physical activity such as walking so in case of any uh, headache dizziness vomiting diarrhea or some other uh, you know symptoms which they could have the not naturopathic treatments were administered during the course of the fasting therapy then the enema was given very compulsorily during the fasting period as a colon cleansing procedure every day and this is how the other fasting therapy differs from the naturopathy fasting therapy so when we just plan for the naturopathy fasting therapy the first day if when we have uh, calculated the calorie we we gave them the boiled diet which is around 1 to 3 4 kilo calorie 1200 34 kilo calorie and in second day we gave them the raw diet it is 904 that is 904 kilo calorie and from third day to seventh day they were under juice fasting uh, we have given them lemon honey juice four times in a day so it it comes around 288 uh, kilo calorie and on eighth day we have broken the fast with mosambi juice which is around 800 kilo calorie and ninth and tenth day we have asked them to go for raw diet and it is again uh, the 900 and 4 kilo calorie this is how the fasting therapy uh, you know group people have given the uh, diet and in control from the first to tenth day the diet was planned as boiled diet whatever we call here and that is 1234 kilo uh, 34 kilo kilo calorie so this is the table which i meant for raw diet and it consists of lemon honey juice mixed vegetable salad sprouts coconut papaya or banana or watermelon and wa- buttermilk then dates or dry grapes and uh, um, and these things are being you know repeated twice lemon honey juice and the raw diet on uh, raw diet day and i have one more table here which says about the uh, boiled diet which Uh, consists of lemon honey juice twice and uh, chapati semi polished rice bland boiled vegetables and uh, boiled vegetables with pulses uh, then fruit like papaya or banana or watermelon then buttermilk uh, total calorie is calculated as uh, 1234 uh, because we are giving two meals and uh, we are uh, following you know uh, two juices per day so coming to the assessments we have un, uh, gone for anthropometric measures and that is being measured by a physician and we also went for serum leptin estimation and it was done by a biochemist both physician biochemist were blind to group allocation and not involved in the recruitment of the subjects in this study 
the body weight was measured using the digital weighing machine and height was measured using calibrated stereometer bmi was measured using equation weight in kgs by height in meter square the weight circumference was measured midway between the inferior costal margin and iliac crest using gulick anthropometric tape the circumference of the hip was measured around the pelvis at the point of maximal protrusion of the buttock the waist hip ratio was measured to assess the body fat distribution coming to the assessment of the serum leptin level 5 ml of venous blood was drawn in a plain container in the morning between 7 am to uh, 9:30 am for both fasting and low calorie diet group and after clotting the serum was separated using centrifuge for 30 minutes then the serum samples were stored at minus 40 degree centigrade the analysis was done by a biochemist within period of 15 days after collecting the samples in a national accredited laboratory we have used enzyme link mino sorbent assay elisa method for the assessment of the serum leptin uh, level sps version 21 was used for the data analysis and uh, baseline differences between the groups were uh, assessed by manwitty you test and fishes uh, dr sujatha dr uh, dr yeah. sujatha sorry yeah. to interrupt yeah. you just yeah. directly go go to the result section and uh, conclusion and uh, discussion part of it please yeah yeah uh, go to yeah, the result section so that yeah yeah, yeah. i mean ha yes section fine, fine 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 result section okay. only it is in because uh, yeah like considering the yeah, time i just requesting you yeah 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 uh, now uh, this is the table of demographic uh, variables and this is what i want to tell you here if you can just see the changes in between the group they are very much uh, you know significant but, uh, but changes between the group we do not find uh, you know uh, significant result in the leptin in other uh, other uh, variables like body weight bmi and uh, waist circumference and hip circumference and the waist hip ratio there is significant uh, change so coming to the discussion aspect so we have got weight reduction around 5.25% in our uh, study so it is in par with the other studies and uh, we can just see uh, the other studies where the fasting for 14 days had uh, decreased mean mean weight by 5.16 the traditional dietary approach also decreased the weight and uh, in uh, low calorie diet and weight reduction we have got 2.57% of reduction and uh, we can have you know many other uh, studies which support this and next coming to the leptin and weight reduction here uh, we could see that the leptin levels in fasting group was decreased by 47% and in low calorie diet it was uh, 24.12% so we can just see that reduction in leptin level in fasting group is high but uh, when we compared between those two groups there was no significant change as such uh, so in the discussion i would like to say that the lemon honey juice which we are using for the fasting it helped in uh, reducing bmi and uh, body weight and it increased the beta oxidation uh, in during fasting and intake of whole grains and fruits and vegetable help to decrease the weight because they have low glycemic index and uh, more fiber and they are antioxidant and the phytochemicals are present in that and because of the presence of the minerals uh, our diet might have helped them and the presence of the iron digested carbohydrates in whole grains you know it uh, helped in uh, reducing the in intestinal transit time thereby it uh, reduces the risk of the weight gain then we uh, have some uh, other papers where short term fasting for 10 days okay it uh, was not having any adverse effect and same thing we have observed in our uh, study also and uh, very low calorie diet 
it uh, suppressed hunger because of the ketosis ketosis and uh, here in naturopathic fasting we just give importance for the breaking of the fast because it is very important in naturopathy philosophy and it is being done with the mosambi juice or sweet lime juice and uh, it has more fiber content and it prepares the body to return to the raw diet and uh, later on we go for the boiled diet also and here in our fasting therapy group Uh, the acute symptoms had occurred like headache nausea and fever and uh, we consider it as the body's effort to eliminate the toxins so we have managed with enema ice water sipping ice bag to the abdomen hip bath hot foot bath and uh, you know water drinking and we uh, also implemented regular walking to prevent the muscle loss and uh, the limitation Their follow-up was not uh, studied, and there is absence of an active control arm, and uh, there may be sample size error, calculation error, error because of higher effect size, and uh, body loses large volume of water and also muscle mass for some extent. So we cannot just uh, estimate it uh, very properly. And then uh, once the obese and overweight persons are back on regular diet. the percentage of weight loss may be smaller so that also we did not uh, uh, estimate it in this particular study so future direction can be on this particular area where the long term sustained adherence of these different types of diet and uh, fasting therapy can uh, you know be used as a uh, major uh, management technique for weight loss so coming to the conclusion both naturopathic based fasting therapy and naturopathic based low calorie diet are beneficial in reducing leptin levels and anthropometric measures among obese individuals and these are the references and the references are being continued and i would like to thank you one and all who have uh, listened to my presentation so any questions please for etna chapas and webinar Yeah. Any questions? Very, yeah. Uh, very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sujatha. The way how you have explained about the effects of leptin during the fasting. So usually, this fasting, I guess, this leptin decreases, which is one of the adaptive physiological mechanisms because the leptin's role would be just to suppress the food intake. Maybe it would help in the weight loss. But how far? Like even for a short duration, if person fasts even for one or one day or two day, like in the religi religious fastings, we Hindus do that in other religions also. So will that also help in reducing the leptin levels? Usually after how much of yeah. fasting? Yeah, yeah. So Please the continue. fasting for 52 hours. Okay, that means maybe for two or three days as such. Uh, it it helps to reduce the leptin level. But uh, this is the breakthrough to start, you know, a good weight reduction program as such. Because whenever there is decrease in the leptin level. the leptin resistance also will be decreased the effect of the fasting when you go for the maybe intermittent or short or whatever it is that can be a good start for the weight reduction that is what we have seen with our patients so once they start with the fasting and once they think that they can control their hunger then they can just go for the low calorie diet also to sustain the weight So possibly, as you said, you have yeah. told a very vital point that it will it may also reduce the insulin resistance. Though it reduces the leptin levels, the quality of the leptin might be increased with the fasting. Maybe that is a process of detoxification. I guess very vital information you have uh, given today. Very good. And the thing is, for short fasting and all, even you advise fasting even for healthy individuals as well in a normal routine. Yeah, here, here we can just go for uh, healthy individuals only. and here we have uh, selected uh, healthy individuals who are having bmi more than 25 uh, kg per meter square so uh, that is applicable for all the people and uh, e even in disease condition like you know hypercholesteremia or in maybe maybe in hypertension or diabetes also we can just go for uh, fasting and hormonal uh, uh, imbalances like uh, pcod or hypothyroidism also we can just uh, introduce the short term fasting we do go for such uh, short term fasting in our uh, setup in the stm college of uh, naturopathy and yogic sciences 
Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Sujata. Very well explained. And especially now, this is the main uh, important points of research. Now it's been focused on. Now it's been shifted to leptin, grenin, and their resistance and their uh, significance on the blood brain barriers also. The research is being uh, shifting or it's uh, focused on all these things now at, at present. Now it's been shifted from BMI to all these things now. Just the body composition analysis, analysis and all research shift ho gaya hai. Now, uh, and I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sujata. Now let's move thank on. You. Thank you very much. Now let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Ravikant K. Dr. Ravikant K trained, that is Kongara, trained in surgical gastroenterology, which is a three years super speciality after post graduation from prestigious Nizam's uh, Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. With a special interest in bariatric surgery, with a special interest in bariatric surgery, he has pursued advanced training in bariatric and metabolic surgeries in Belgium and also did his fellowship in advanced laparoscopy from Italy. He has over eight years of experience as a consultant, gastro, surgical gastroenterologist and bariatric surgeon. He was one of the pioneers in bariatric surgery in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana and is doing highest number of bariatric surgeries per month in South India. He performed bariatric surgeries on one of the most difficult, toughest and most risky patients who are about more than 200 to 250 kgs of weight. Interestingly, he has also performed bariatric surgery on his mother three years ago to relieve her of her diabetes and 80 units of insulin. Her areas of interest, uh, his areas of interests are minimally invasive bariatric surgery, colorectal cancer, other gastrointestinal cancers and bariatric genetics and epidemiology. He has various publications in renowned journals and presented papers in various conferences. Please welcome Dr. Ravi Kant to deliver his talk on role of bariatric surgery in yoga and how it can be improved. Please welcome Dr. Ravi Kant. Please start your session. Uh, good, morning. Uh, good morning, madam, for the kind introduction. And uh, am I audible and my voice is it clear? Yes, 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 very much. So, uh, actually... Will it be uh, possible to keep your slides on a slideshow mode? It's uh, it's not coming on a full screen. Uh, full screen slideshow mode. Try okay. or otherwise carry on like this. Yeah, yeah, slideshow. If it's not coming, it's okay. It doesn't matter. Continue like that. Yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Full better, screen? better. Continue, continue. Chale uh, okay. No problem. So the uh, important topic and uh, thanks for uh, this opportunity and uh, in the academic front and my topic is role of bariatric surgery in obesity and uh, how can it be improved with uh, other natural methods like yoga and other uh, uh, natural all the methods put together and uh, uh, coming to the uh, magnitude of the problem i think uh, 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 more than 50 percent of the uh, uh, population in uh, united states are uh, obese and 80 percent of the school children are unfit for uh military recruitment so that is the magnitude of the problem and such a problem cannot be handled with a surgery that's a mass problem so such a magnitude problem has uh, should have a solution which is natural and uh, effective and uh, uh, cheap and uh, uh, like that so uh, uh, surgery is not any of this so surgery is the last option and uh, uh, always the natural methods are, uh, uh, I strongly recommend them. We suggest surgery when everything failed and patients are in the desperate mode and uh, uh, nothing can uh, help them otherwise. So that, that's the reason. Uh, so uh, one important thing I want to uh, 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 tell you is, uh, there is uh, this uh, tsunami sugar is um, uh, not a scientific term which uh, this is, I coined this term. Actually, uh, the thing is, we have seen a uh, sugar patients and obesity patients, lot of them. And uh, all of them are uh, usually, uh, the, I have seen a sugar patient who is diabetic at the age of uh, 30 years and, uh, and his HbA1c is under control with uh, good medicines, uh, even uh, with the slightest of the medicine like glycomate and uh, all. And after 40 years also, his sugar is also uh, the same and without uh, much fluctuation. On the other hand, I have seen patients where 
developed sugar at the age of 25 and by the age of 27 uh, 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 grossly uncontrolled sugar and both kidneys are damaged and needing a transplant creatinine and going on to uh, dialysis and uh, requiring a transplant so when you say diabetes diabetes is uh, extending from uh, one percent severity to 99 percent severity so diabetes is not the same for everyone some patients it is tsunami sugar like uh, destruction everywhere and so fast and we cannot uh, uh, control it also so and uh, other uh, uh, in the same way it this uh, this spectrum of the disease applies for many diseases it includes obesity also so uh, these are the important uh, questions which everyone should be able to answer after uh, 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 this presentation why some people eat a lot and still be lean and uh, why some people eat less and healthy food and still obese uh, how many lean people are following healthy diet and lifestyle if you ask if you do a small survey uh, of 1000 patients who are lean and ask them everyone how many of you are uh, waking up early going for a walk or going for a good lifestyle and uh, like that majority are not uh, doing that and uh, uh, dr rapi uh, yes yes your slides are not moving okay now no they are not okay then no, okay then uh, yes, now is no, it okay yes oh, yes it okay is. then i will do like this so these are the uh, important uh, uh, causes of uh, rare causes of uh, uh, severe obesity and one things are uh, congenital leptin deficiency and mcr4 mutations leptin receptor deficiency and all i want to show one important video this uh, this boy is a prader willi syndrome is the video playing hello yeah uh, yes. it is it is yeah so this boy is a prader willi syndrome patient and uh, 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 almost i have two prader willi syndrome this is before surgery and after surgery 100 kilos reduced these people will have uh, uh, almost very severe hunger which cannot be uh, even decreased by uh, uh, our uh, bariatric surgery also these people are prader willi syndrome patients will have such a hunger even after full stomach also they still feel they are not eaten for uh, 3 days or something like that these people even take the uh, food from the dustbin and eat so if it is not available whatever there in the dustbin that is the cravings uh, such people will have and uh, this patient surgery was done almost uh, oh, 5 years back and he lost uh, 100 kilograms and he gained around about 30 kilograms again so uh, uh, because of the severe hormonal and uh, prader willi syndrome patients will have such a uh, uh, severe uh, thing this patient is albright syndrome hereditary osteodystrophy you can see the dental anomalies also and uh, uh, this baby and one thing we a uh, lot of uh, other conditions are there the severity may be different there are so many condition which were not yet defined clearly so this baby uh, from madhya pradesh she came all the way from there and uh, she had some problem in the stomach uh, uh, for which she got uh, surgery done at aims and midline laparotomy scar was there and uh, even uh, and uh, she is having severe obstructive sleep apnea and you can see the eyes are also completely covered with fat and unable to open and severe snoring and uh, some fall in oxygen also and the, she is a one year old uh, girl uh, youngest uh, 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 where i did the surgery and uh, coming to the next patient uh, uh, the same patient and uh, uh, this baby, uh, this girl is a congenital leptin deficiency you can see because of the severe weight there is a, a varus deformity the uh, legs are also bent uh, inwards and uh, she is in severe pain of uh, every step of uh, she takes uh, she is in uh, severe pain uh, so her father is carrying her and uh, her father weight is 65 kilograms and her weight is 67 kilograms and but he uh, he has to carry her and now she is uh, uh, going on her after the surgery she lost weight and she is going on uh, to the school on her own so uh, this is also these are all the rare rare uh, uh, situations congenital conditions you can see this is the uh, uh, same patient this is another patient from bengal west bengal uh, she is also uh, uh, lost uh, significant weight uh, uh, in this patient we could not identify the genetic condition 
uh, whether it is leptin deficiency or other any other deficiency we could not uh, 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 because in every patient we may not be able to find the exact cause so this boy is also having a, a little bit of obesity and genetic uh, 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 problem uh, this boy uh, died uh, in the process of evaluation and uh, uh, in the process of evaluation uh, we did not do any surgery or any treatment uh, so this patient is from uh, uh, jharkhand and uh, at one year uh, uh, she is uh, more than uh, uh, 99 percentile weight and uh, uh her uh, she ha uh, out of four siblings uh, how, four brothers and sister two people affected with the surge, uh, with the uh, severe weight genetic problem uh, that is leptin deficiency and uh, other pair, other two siblings are uh, totally lean and uh, her sister uh, her sister died at the age of uh, who suffered with the same genetic condition leptin deficiency died at the age of 3 years now uh, they could uh, they could find a way for this and they came to me and uh, surgery was done uh, the same baby uh, after the surgery now she is uh, still alive after 4 years of surgery and now she is walking uh, on her own so so these are the rare rare causes of the things and one more important thing i would uh, like to share is you can see she is unable to walk she cannot uh, bear any weight on her uh, legs and uh, if the father asks her to dard dard this that what she is saying she is from jharkhand dard dard so uh, she cannot stand at the time when she was admitted and uh, these are the people where so this is another baby uh, she is from punjab uh, she amritsar uh, she came to uh, uh, us uh, for the these are all the desperate no no solution they could find anywhere and uh, uh, pediatric uh, bariatric surgery is not uh, a very well proven uh, thing so unfortunately i have not done because uh, uh, we could not uh, anesthetize the patient we could not get the this 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 is the only one patient where we could not do surgery uh, because of the severe severe obesity and uh, she died uh, after uh, one and half year because she is the one patient where uh, we are also unable to do surgery so the same baby she died recently so this is another uh, rare uh, 2% of the obesity is because because of cushing syndrome this is cushing syndrome by seeing the skin texture you can uh, tell uh, this is the classical textbook description of lemon on, uh, lemon on the toothpick appearance so this boy uh, is around 20 years and he also we did not do the surgery in some uh, because uh, of financial problems or uh, some of the other uh, uh, fear problems uh, they they don't come till the late, late stage and uh, the uh, this boy is also died he is having uh, iatrogenic cushing so so and uh, one of the most common cause of uh, uh, death because of extreme obesity is you can see the oxygen concentration which is 63 60 50% once 50% he opened his eyes and uh, 48% he opened his eyes and taking the deep breaths and uh, uh, when the oxygen goes further down uh, majority of the obese people die in sleep this is one of the celebrity who go, got the bariatric surgery done adnan sami uh this is another uh, 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 uh you know uh, him and this is my patient 215 kg and after the bariatric surgery you can see there is a lot of uh, change and you can still see there is a lot of uh, uh, fat at the uh, loose skin uh, which is hanging uh, uh, which was uh, hidden under the uh, uh, pants and uh, after the abdominal press the excess skin is removed this is exactly the my waist my jeans so this is my jeans 34 or 33 waist size uh, so though some people can uh, lose weight by natural methods also there are uh, 50 kg 70 kg weight loss is possible but this kind of uh, shape uh, at the uh, hips is not possible without a tummy tuck 
because surgery after more than 100 kgs of weight loss, uh, the loose skin also needs to be addressed. Otherwise, uh, uh, that uh, uh, very good feel doesn't come. Uh, th uh, that loose skin problem will not come for the less than 50 kg weight loss. And this is uh, uh, our Venkai Naidu who publicly announced that he got the bariatric surgery done almost 10 years over and he's off the insulin for the past uh, uh, 10 years and uh, 100 units insulin is stopped, BP medication stopped. This is another celebrity who got the surgery done and uh, insulin is stopped. SP Balasubramaniam, he's also got the surgery done eight years back. He's another movie star where uh, whom I did the bariatric surgery on him. Earlier patient I did not do. And this is another uh, uh, doctor, he's a gynecologist. Actually the important slow role of yoga, uh, healthy lifestyle comes, uh, I will give the example of this doctor who lost uh, almost 60 kilograms and now he uh, he he stopped uh, using car he stopped using uh, all the uh, two wheelers and he's uh, going moving from one hospital to other hospital on a uh, bike and uh, doing the surgeries and uh, so almost five years over he did not gain so i don't say that bariatric surgery is uh, the only solution if you don't follow the healthy lifestyle after the surgery patients still can gain weight there are people who drink alcohol a lot even after the surgery they uh, there are people who take uh, uh, rich calories small quantity food for example ice creams and uh, they are dense calories so if they keep on cheating themselves once in a week once in 10 days ice cream is okay but every day, uh, some people uh, get the one uh, uh, one kilogram uh, ice cream uh, uh, into their home and keep the in the freezer. And uh, whenever they feel like one scoop, one scoop, if they eat, I think no bariatric surgery can uh, uh, save them. But there is another uh, one kind of bariatric surgery, which is gastric bypass. For such patient, gastric bypass, whenever they eat sweet, they will get dumping. So whenever they get dumping, no, they get uh, hot flushes like sensation, uh, unpleasant sensation all over the body. Uh, for that patients, I think uh, such a, uh, that, that may be a uh, thing. And this is acanthosis nigricans. You can see, uh, you may be seeing in a lot of young patients also acanthosis nigricans. This patient uh, is a railway employee. You can see the waist circumference is 150 centimeter tape, one and a half meter tape is not sufficient. His waist circumference is more than his height. And uh, he's also, uh, by the time he came to me, already he had uh, renal failure, creatinine is 2.5. Uh, he was feared of surgery and he died after uh, uh, almost uh, three, uh, three months after coming to me. And this is another patient, uh, uh, 237 kg patient. And you can see there is a lymphedema because of uh, circulation problems. You can see there is a uh, uh, continuous uh, seepage of water uh, uh, lymph from the, uh, there is a bucket you can see always. Every day almost 20 liters of uh, lymph is uh, oozing from this place. You can see in this uh, uh, third photograph where the entire ulceration is healed. For healing of the ulceration, it took uh, uh, almost 30 days and uh, by fasting and all, I applied all the natural methods of fasting. Once the wound is reduced, then I subjected the patient for the surgery. And this is another patient. Uh, you can see uh, he also have severe uh, uh, varicose veins uh, problem and uh, 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 lipodermatosclerosis. You can see the black color skin uh, below the knee and that is all damaged skin and that is also got reversed. This is another patient where uh, he came beyond, after uh, uh, I could not save him. He came uh, in the final stages. I could not save him. And some people uh, will be surprised. This is a 25 year old uh, man. He's a car driver by occupation and by uh, uh, various uh, myths and wrong opinions about surgery, he did not came. He is around uh, 225 kgs and you can see the stomach which is shining because of a uh, lot of fluid accumulation, uh, leg swelling, and this is a very deadly sign. And a patient who are having such uh, shining uh, uh, abdomen, they are at a high risk of death. By the time he came to me, he is in a severe shortness of breath. I admitted him and the next day uh, he died. So uh, a very, very unfortunate thing. People at the age of 25, I have four patients uh, uh, below the age of uh, 30 years coming in this uh, uh, scenario and dying. So these are all the things where uh, the society never see such a society may be seeing obese patients roaming around, not losing for 10 years. 
but society will never see obese patient dying of obesity and every day we get a referrals after the everything is gone and where we cannot save the patients so early referrals for extreme obese patients uh, uh, helps uh, a lot and uh, this is the same patient she is my mother uh she's on uh, i admitted her in our uh, naturopathy hospital with uh, manthan satyanand rajgaru and for three times she is on uh, uh 80 to 100 units of insulin her blood sugar was uh, uh, uh around uh, uh, 350 and 400 fasting and uh, uh, three times we admitted in the manthan satyanand nagar ashram and three times she lost 7 kg in 7 to 5 kg in uh, uh, one month duration and her insulin be stopped every time she get admitted but uh, uh, again once she comes uh, to home uh, in the ashram she could do do it well the fasting and she could follow a disciplined life once she come and uh, spends with uh, grandchildren children and i think i think uh, um, uh, she could not so because uh, her uh, uh, sugars are on the hba1c is 10.5 so we got up, uh, after 3 years of uh, conservative management i opted for bariatric surgery now almost 6 uh, years over and uh, she lost 22 kilos and uh, no insulin from the uh, no insulin no sugar tablets till now so we are coming this is another problem uh, young patients 22 25 27 uh, boys and girls are coming and uh, they are opting for surgery which uh, even personally i don't recommend uh, if uh, such uh, patients are my family members so but uh, people are becoming so desperate and they are coming in tears after losing one or two good matches so suppose a unmarried girl i have done 1500 uh, more than 1500 girls who are unmarried who are uh, 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 bariatric surgery they are literally in tears when uh, a good match is rejected because of obesity <laughs> 100 kg is girl or 14 120 kg boy after a uh, 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 after looking for a match and uh, after uh, 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 everything is okay then because of obesity a good match is gone they will not sleep for one week or 10 days so the, uh, then they will come for the surgery in a desperate uh, thing suppose if they come at the age of 21 22 uh, years we give time because there is still time for the marriage 25 26 so if they are uh, uh, if they are coming at 20 uh, 27 25 a girl at the age of 27 100 kilos uh, uh, not getting married and if we postpone that her uh, marriage prospects also will be lost so these are all the one uh, you might be accrossing uh, daily uh, uh, in and out they those who are reluctant to uh, do diet and exercise we cannot help them there are disciplined people uh, who lost uh, weight and uh, maintained weight by ma- natural methods these are the ones uh, who either doesn't want even if we tell them we will send them always i never do a surgery for any patient with, without giving an option of going to an ashram and say, staying there for at least one month try try once so it is unethical to do surgery when the patient first comes to us so we have to give them how difficult it is to reduce by diet and exercise once they know the value of weight loss then we, uh, when everything is failed or they could not cope up because of their job their lifestyle and all then if we give the surgical result they will uh, 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 maintain the result for long time it is like uh, if we if a person doesn't know the value of the money if we give them money they will spend like uh, anything but if they know the difficulty in earning money and then we give money then they will use wisely so that is my concept so i will always give the patient a option to go for an ashram for going for one month two months or uh, even stopping the studies doesn't matter even if you fail in studies doesn't matter if you fail in life fail in health uh, everything is gone so once the health is gone everything is gone uh, so this boy uh, this man uh, around 42 years and uh, he's uh, uh, 212 kg he's still in front of my eyes i convinced him for uh, one, uh, one and half hour one and half hour i told him uh, don't go outside the hospital get admitted get the surgery done immediately otherwise there is a chance of uh, uh, death so uh, he he said i will come within a week and he gone home he is from rajamandri 
and he never come back after a week i called him and his uh, her daughter uh, told that he uh, he died in the sleep i showed you a video of obstructive sleep apnea this is another patient you can see the lipodermatosclerosis because of varicose veins the legs are totally skin over the legs is uh, uh, totally destroyed and this is another uh, the same patient uh, you can see the uh, uh, this patient uh, walking uh, and uh, the excoriation is because of uh, while going into the bathroom the skin got rub to the wall and uh, there is a formation this is another video okay it's not playing so okay then uh, uh this one okay then uh, is it okay Uh, uh the slides are moving uh now it is uh, frozen but uh, 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 dr ravikant i just wanted to say, tell you that for congenital deformities and all i guess uh, this uh, bariatric surgery is really really helping right yes. am i right because yes. there is no other option left for them and the good part is it is learned that usually you will be sending them before surgeries and all you are giving in them a try and the value of the food and weight reduction at least they'll know it the value of it so it is important to know that bariatric surgery is a life saving procedure however yes. conditions apply but yes. uh, from your lecture i guess you are really handling the emotional aspect of the patients and even you are thinking from the practical point of view from the patient's view really really I, good actually every patient we should take a decision exactly like if this patient is my brother or sister and my mother what i will do exactly the same thing we should do to them if uh, i feel that my mother needs to be uh, uh, need not be hurried up for surgery she should be given at least 3 to 4 trials uh, i i should apply the same thing to the uh, patient because we have so many patients because one happy patient will be referring for the entire life if we hurry them up for surgery and they, we don't give a cho choice of non surgical weight loss Uh, and after uh, two years, uh, they may come and ask, "Doctor, you have not given me uh, this option of non-surgical, and you have uh, straight away operated on me. That is a very embarrassing. Uh, uh, that is, uh, and one more thing is that is not ethical also. So uh, maybe, so, doctor, maybe, doctor Ravi, maybe of uh, because your emotional aspect and your practical, it's really reflecting on the way how you are explaining. Maybe that is why you are the most. Uh, Uh, what do you say successful doctor in this one bariatric surgeon and being a super speciality and just even uh, talking at the patient's point of view it is very commendable really appreciable and hope the patients are really really getting benefited with that though there is a risk with every of the surgeries and all but before ending this one i just a few doubt because see you are also a surgical gastroenterologist so yes. it it doesn't mean that one has to come like 100 kilos or 200 kilos they have to reach you suppose yeah. if a person comes with somewhere around 80 kilos for her height and all if she is overweight or some somewhere around 85 or something so like before going to the taking a decision because see even body composition analysis and all if we see the visceral fat because metabolic obesity is being highlighted nowadays because of the subcutaneous fat and the visceral fat and all so even for those patients would you analyze the cardiovascular risk profile before suggesting for any of the uh, other treatment modalities adopted Yes, yes. We take all the precautions, including cardiac uh, risk assessment, everything. And uh, for example, is my mother's BMI is thirty one. She is eighty yes. two kilos, and uh, that twenty kilos loss makes a miraculous improvement in their lifestyle. In I their, agree. In uh, their uh, that twenty kilos in a ladies who are around five feet is yes. almost like forty kilos in a six feet tall uh, man. so yes. uh, uh, so and sometimes the some people will be 50 kilos extra but metabolically they are healthy like uh, they don't have diabetes they don't have uh, any other uh, obesity related comorbidities okay we can give them a try and uh, for a, uh, but uh, sometimes even uh, uh, I, I, uh, one gynecologist came to me and she is around 76 kg and uh, i said uh, madam why sir, for 76 kilograms why you are opting for bariatric surgery uh, so you can try diet and exercise and you know you are a doctor you know everything uh, she said straight away one thing dr ravi do you know what i eat uh, how much careful i am 
so uh, 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 i am taking all the uh, things i am taking i need only one assurance from you can you do it safely to me so i said it is a 15 minutes job so if, uh, usually surgery takes 15 minutes to 25 minutes that's all yeah, yeah. because we do only one surgery every day morning to evening so we are, our speed and accuracy has improved our results improved a lot and uh, uh, she got the surgery done and she lost uh, she came to 76 to 52 uh, which is uh, her ideal weight and she was happy so she came to such a extent that uh, if i don't operate she want to go to some other uh, person or something like that so but even then when the risk is less risk of surgery is like risk of appendix surgery risk of uh, gallbladder surgery and it takes 15 to 20 minutes and uh, uh, usually they will walk one hour after the surgery and they will get discharged the next day 95 percent of the time some extreme obese patients they will we will keep them in uh, sometimes for months together but most of the times uh, 150 and below usually they get discharged on the next day okay it is a very uh, short uh, it's, a, it's a very simple procedure it sounds like that yeah uh, in the uh, uh, if you uh, select the patients carefully and uh, it is very risky also if you are uh, not selecting the patient carefully and you are not waiting when you are supposed to wait and before surgery i i have so much respect for fasting because before surgery i will make every patient to fast for 5 days I see miracles in those five days. Some people coming with uh, uh, 400, 600 blood sugar, which is not controlled with insulin. Five days fasting, it comes to 150. And you might have seen uh, seeing every day. And lot of allopathic doctor doesn't know this fact. A lot of endocrinologists, diabetologists doesn't know this fact. Five days fasting on sugar makes such a miraculous improvement. And uh, those are all I have seen. And uh, you should carefully select the patients. There are risks are there. There are deaths are uh, uh, reported uh, usually, but the risk of bariatric surgery is like risk of appendix surgery. But appendix surgery patients are not overweight. So appendix yes. weights are lean. If you do uh, bariatric surgery on lean patient, the risk is like appendix only. So if you do obese patients uh, appendix surgery, the same risk as because there are people who come at the verge of death. At yeah. that uh, and high risk patient, if we do the percentage of risk because of surgery is different, risk because of obesity is different. We should not yeah. combine both. That's why bariatric surgery got a little bit of bad name because of no, uh, improper selection and uh, some deaths, VIP deaths also, a uh, lot of uh, uh, negativism in the society. Yeah, that is true. But once if we see your uh, videos, how you are saying the patients, even it, it gives us a hope that at least it is working as a life-saving mode as well. So yes, some yes. sort of an awareness is to be brought. But the thing is, even at the grassroots level, even at the individual level, may not be super obese cases, but obesity is very much prevalent now because in India it's been increased from 9.7% to 20%. And in developed, compared to developed countries, even in developing countries, it is 30% higher when compared to developed countries, unfortunately. And uh, even if you see the scenario, the settings also, the earlier it used to be like low income group, uh, high income groups. Now it's been shifted that it has been more onto all, even in the rural areas also, it's been prevalent. So it's like educating at the grassroots levels and the individual levels. I guess even the clinicians have a very, very major role in controlling this obesity uh, rise, overall obesity. It's, a, it's like a carpet uh, treatment, I think. It's a blanket view if you see like that. Possibly. Uh, one, one important factor uh, uh, you have uh, brought out, madam. The thing is, uh, I have a patient who is an auto driver who is 200 kilos. I yes. said, uh, uh, how much you earn a day? Uh, I, I earn around uh, 400 rupees or something like that a day, sir. Then how can you become so obese? Sir? He said for 400 rupees, if uh, I have to satisfy my hunger, if I go and eat the regular healthy food, my daily earnings are not sufficient. But if I, my hunger has to get satisfied, I have to eat uh, like uh, uh, deep fried uh, noodles and uh, yes. like that. On a, they are very cheap. For 50 rupees, he can uh, uh, sustain uh, his hunger. But even healthy food also, the, which could not sustain because they are dipped in oil and uh, deep fried. So yes. another one important thing is the uh, uh, lady with whom you are uh, seeing on the screen, 
she is uh, 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 130 kilos and uh, she infertility for 13 years and she underwent uh, uh, ivf procedure four times and each time one and a half look uh, one and a half lakh she spent and no result so i don't understand why uh, many of the ivf centers or uh, many of the knee replacement center yeah, obesity is a contraindication for doing that you should do knee replacement once the patient loses weight otherwise their function will be lost she lost uh, uh, 40 50 kilos and after that she conceived uh, uh, twice and she has uh, one daughter and one son now and uh, uh, without any uh, uh, ivf or anything naturally she conceived you might be seeing after 10 kilos weight loss also the pregnancy uh, conceivable risk will uh, 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 rate will improve tremendously even 5 kilos or 10 kilos makes a tremendous improvement in uh, pcod yeah that's really really correct very vital things you have explained dr Ra- ravi and we thank you very much for accepting your invitation and i know how busy you are because i've been trying to speak to you <laughs> really you i it appears you are very very busy has been very busy schedule but in spite of that you have accepted our invitation and uh, come as a speaker thank you so much dr ravi thank you thank you very much thank you very much now ladies and gentlemen let's move on to our next speaker dr anvi nandeep dr anvi nandeep did his bnys from gandhi naturopathic medical college hyderabad and md in naturopathy from sdm college of naturopathy and yogic sciences he has over 5 years of clinical experience and is also actively involved in research he has over 5 publications in various reputed journals he is presently the research medical officer in manthan satyanarayan raja arogya layam vijayawada which is famous for providing salt free diet for patients please welcome uh, dr anvik nandip to deliver his talk on low salt diet in obesity management please nandip start your session and uh, dr ravikant please uh, uh, unshare your uh, slides no yes now you can share uh, nandip yeah uh, is uh, is yes. my my very much visible yes full yeah. slides yes thank you uh, Yep. Uh, thank you for hand over in the session. First, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, CCRYN and Director Raghavendra sir uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so my topic was like low salt diet in obesity management. How low low salt or salt affects the obesity. So moving forward, like everybody knows that salt is composed of 40 percentage of uh, sodium and 60 percentage of chloride, and even World Health Organization. given an rda about the salt about 5 grams only daily requirement of salt is required only 5 grams whereas uh, considering sodium it is only required for 2 grams why the sodium requirement is uh, why the why we need to see about the 2 uh, grams is because sodium is not comes only from our uh, uh, extra added salt in our food it is comes from the other so other uh, stuff like uh, you know uh, beverages nowadays beverages has been uh, adulterated or it's been uh, uh, mixed with the uh, preservatives like sodium benzoate or or other kind of sodium related things because sodium acts as a preservative so those things also need to be considered so average consumption of salt is uh, nowadays it's been uh, like uh, 9 to 12 grams per day because Uh, this was this statistics was uh, um, done in um, give a taken from the america so mainly in india it might be different because we use uh, as a south indians we use lot of pickles and not indian there will be some or the other items that generally people used to follow so in that context sodium entering into the body is become uh, so wide range that that varies according to the age gender and uh, Uh, their uh, localities and environment and their according to their uh, uh, traditional uh, things are uh, traditional food and all so generally sodium enters into the body due to a lot of junk food and refined food beverages battery stuff and pickles and regularly added extra salt in food so basically these becomes a, a very uh, deadly combo to raise the obesity uh, in the mass uh, among the mass people because uh, they, there will be a lot of see all previous uh, 
uh, speakers who are from Shelly Talis ma'am to the uh, Babina, Dr. Dr. Babina and Dr. Uh, uh, Sujata ma'am is even those people has clearly stated and demonstrated that how the calories is affecting the uh, body, how the calories is affecting the obesity, causing the obesity. Uh, along with that, even the more salt diet is also causing the obesity because uh, salt actually salt makes uh, two types of uh, uh, effects on the uh, obesity like you no know, which is one is direct effect and another one is a indirect effect whereas direct effect everybody knows it like there will be a slight water retention will be there due to the salt excess consumption of the salt in the uh, because of hemodynamic changes in the uh, our cbs and cardiovascular system so there will be more water retention but of course that is uh, that is very slight and that will not raise constant weight gain in the uh, body because uh, uh, a proper mechanism of renal excretion happens in the body due to certain uh, due to the factor due, due to various various factors like uh, uh, running on aldosterone uh, converting enzymes all those things as we know and there was a study uh, done in a queen mary university of london they have demonstrated uh, clearly they have uh, stated clearly that each gram that we take excess in a day uh, will increase the risk of obesity by about uh, 28 percentage the study was done on 48 uh, 485 children and 785 adults where they are, they have the beauty of the study why of course the study there are a lot many studies in the uh, in the in the present scenario about the obesity why of course did this study is this study uh, have clearly demonstrated that the they have calculated the 24 hours urinary excretion they have calculated the energy intake all those in the four days energy past four days in energy intake and all they have uh, the beauty of the study is this study is uh, the results were independent of the energy intake. We, uh, apart from the energy intake, they have clearly stated that this uh, one gram of salt increases the 28 percentage of risk uh, in the children and in the adults. Of course, excretion of sodium uh, plays a uh, plays a major role in the weight in the hemodynamics as well as directly. But it depends. It, uh, there are a lot many factors or complexity of the factors uh, uh, makes the excretion or uh, like availability of uh, fluids like dehydration if dehydration is there sodium retention will be more and if there is a lack of physical activities that won't be there that that also causes the to retain the sodium in the uh, circulatory system and the environmental temperatures hormonal hormones and uh, medication drugs like steroids or uh, uh, antidepressant drugs and all etc so uh, the indirect effect how the salt is going to involve in the pathophysiology of the obesity is by the gut brain. So gut brain plays a major role uh, for producing the mucus and uh, perme increasing uh, uh, to regulate the permeability of the absorption and uh, of the dietary products and fermentation. It plays a major role of macro and micronutrients and regulations of fat accumulation and regulates the peristaltic movements. Uh, so the below uh, reference has clearly stated that the high salt, uh, the excess salt consumption or high salt diet reduces the levels of lactobacillus bacteria and other helpful bacteria uh, that I have uh, given clearly. What are the groups of bacteria that seven groups of bacteria is going to be uh, wiped off or it reduces its uh, count in the gut microbiota. So the due to the salt intake, the good bacteria is going to be uh, reduced and there will be a uh, uh, one condition called dysbiosis happens in the gut uh, gut bacteria. So due to dysbiosis, there is, there will be a changes in a intestinal env environment and uh, that leads to the increased energy harvesting from the food uh, that pr produces a certain amount of uh, compounds like uh, short chain fatty acids that absorbs into the intestine and uh, increases the metabol uh, it, it leads to the metabolical disorders. And of course, it alters the mucosal production and mucosal permeabilities also in the in the due to dysbiosis. Uh, because of that, uh, there will be a lot of problem in the uh, obesity. This is happening because there is a gut because of gut bacteria. Of course, uh, changing the gut bacteria or damage to the gut bacteria will be having a lot of uh, complexity because a lot of various factors uh, uh, affects the gut bacteria because antibiotics, even antibiotics affects the gut bacteria, drugs, alcohol, all those things affects the gut bacteria. But even though salt is also having a very, very high impact factor in the uh, uh, for creating the dysbiosis. 
proposed mechanisms and the pathogenesis of obesity by gut bacteria is like high abundance of bacteria like bad bacteria that ferments the carbohydrate so the fermentation of carbohydrate leads to the creating of short chain fatty acids biosynthesis in the intestine itself because before uh, while taking food that uh, short chain fatty acids may not be there but after taking food this due to dysbiosis uh, the short chain fatty acids happen uh, creates or generates in the uh, intestines itself by fermentation process and it will due to lack of uh, um, uh, mucosal uh, mucosa and increasing the permeability of the substances it will enter into the body and act as a storage as a lipids and the glucose and gives you a high energy uh, of, uh, to the human body and and one more thing i already have said that there will be a changes in the permeability uh, due to the lack of uh, due to the dysbiosis and uh, that increases the lipopolysaccharides in the blood resulting the elevated uh, systemic lipopolysaccharides that aggravates actually the increasing the lipopolysaccharides or short chain fatty acids uh, increases the low grade inflammation and insulin resistance and induces the insulin resistance in the body and one more thing is that uh, due to uh, there was one more system called endocannabinoid system which just re generally regulates the git hormonal production even ghrelin uh, very very important hepatite product hepatite hormone it plays a very major role that endocannabinoid system in all the parts of the body the endocannabinoid receptors will be present uh, so the through the endocannabinoid system the brain is going to uh, activate or change the metabolic rates and metabolic uh, things and as well as uh, it uh, it it, uh, it works for the communication in between cells and uh, it uh, communicates with the it, uh, it helps to communicate the brain with the immune system and uh, to regulate the appetite and to regulate the metabolism and memory even so the when there is a dysbiosis the endocannabinoid system is going to be hampered or it will be it is not like a hampering it will be overactive so when there is a overactivity of the uh, endocannabinoid system so what it, it it promotes the visceral fat and the peripheral fat even so that leads to the weight gain so uh, and one more indirect effect that uh, that involves in the um, risk of obesity is immune system so uh, even uh, there is a due to dysbiosis uh, there is a lot of changes in the immune system uh, that happens and that that will not that may not increase the obesity but it will increase the comorbidities and risk factors of the obesity and the mortality rate and the salt intakes not only drives the uh, uh, hemodynamics as we said already uh, so uh, actually the immune system is a very complex uh, system to understand how the salt is going to affect the immune system there are several other factors like age gender hereditary and renin angiotensin mechanisms and sympathetic nerve uh, activity endothelial dysfunction and availability of antioxidant and uh, uh, availability of uh, free radicals also unsecretory i mean the uh, uh, free radicals that generates in the body salt uh, intake promotes the inflammation in the body via dysbiosis in the intestines which in turn damages the immune immune system the high amount of immune cells like lymphocytes macrophages neutrophils all those things will be generally accumulate near the uh, intestinal fluids or in the intestine and peripheral regions of the skin and as well as lungs and other areas where generally um, a person or human body in come in contact with the uh, atmosphere or environment that uh, for this uh, the researchers found that there is a high amount of sodium concentrations are, are present in the same areas that means interstitial fluid of the peripheral regions of skin and as well as uh, I mean, uh, we need to get sweat whenever required right so obviously the uh, more salt concentrations will be there in the peripheral of the skin and in the, in, the, in the intestines uh, to regulate them uh, various metabolisms so this sodium is modulating the immune cells in the negative way in turn immune cells becomes the responsible for the inflammation in the body so that inflammation what what do you mean by what what are things that in, in inflammation that happens is uh, salt prevents the flow inflammatory reactivity that means the inflammatory mediators start reactivity to the towards the triggering factors and it induces the vascular endothelial dysfunctions uh, that may lead to the uh, ovarian veins or uh, cvd conditions or in uh, uh, conditions like plague formation in uh, uh, in paralysis and etc 
so that increases the immune sensitivity towards the uh, uh, self or our own antigens and cytokine secretions will re, uh, increase and there is a changes in the t t and b uh, b cells activity and macrophages and uh, as well as we have they have clearly the uh, down reference the below reference has clearly demo uh, indicated that was a review article Uh, so th they have clearly indicated that there is a reduction in the neutrophil activity due to the high salt consumption and even in a macrophage activity macrophages activity <coughs> and that increases a and one more thing is salt increases the sensitivity of the t helper cells uh, the cells that which generally identify the antigens and activates the immune system the point first line of activity that happens in the immune system so all those cells is becomes a hypersensitivity the hypersensitivity due to that hypersensitivity even uh, the cells is uh, uh, recognizing our own antigens as a foreign antigens and even tnf alpha will increase interferons interleukin 4 6 13 17 26 all this uh, all these are um, very very important for the uh, comorbidity risk of the obesity that leads to the hypersensitivity and allergic reactions is going to happen so uh, finally the inflammatory mediator causes autoimmune disorders like metabolic disorders obesity pcod etc and hypertension cvd due to the endothelial dysfunction uh, diabetes insulin resistance beta cell dysfunction cancers hypersensitivity to the pathogens and uh, coming to the our arogyalayam uh, we call it as arogyalayam uh, naturopathy hospital uh msr arogyalayam mantan sachinand raju arogyalayam it was the biggest naturopathy hospital established uh, in 2012 running under public charitable trust with no profit and no loss base with a capacity of 600 bed bedded uh, with 85 occupant 85% is occupancy uh, we are uh, we are having throughout the year with a uh, with established in a 18 acres of land with 75% of full of landscaping at the river bank uh, krishna uh, it is near to vijayawada and in the in the uh, in our arogyalayam or in our hospital there are 500 plus staff who are working in various clinical and non clinical departments and 20 naturopathy doctors uh, will be observing all the activities and or uh, supervising the activities and all and five uh, physiotherapy doctors are there to look after the physiotherapy and 100 plus treatments like including physiotherapy acupuncture acupressure uh the facilities are been provided to the patients propagating of naturopathy among the masses through the print and electronic and social media will be very active in uh, media uh, so uh, and we have a emergency facility to handle the medical emergencies whenever required like while playing or while doing yoga there might be some kind of uh, um, uh, fractures happen some it might happen some fractures or some or the other medical condition giddiness may happen or all those things to look after Uh, and we have a 24 hours into 7 doctor supervision is available and 365 days the doctor consultations are free and uh, we mainly uh, stress on the salt oil and sugar free diets so our in our arogyalayam we are 100% salt free diet we are giving to the patient to rejuvenate uh, in a faster way uh, this is our river view of our arogyalayam and this is aerial view of our landscape this is a uh, our reception area where generally uh, the first uh, primary contact for a patient and this was our treatments that we have that uh, he baths jacuzzis massages and colon hydrotherapy packs vibro massages hydro relax uh, full immersion spinal spray spinal baths and uh, all the other naturopathy treatments that generally regularly all the um, uh, treatment i mean uh, all the naturopathy uh, inpatient hospitals used to have and we have even sand bath plantain leaf baths and uh, mud packs and all mud baths and all and so these are the our physiotherapy doctors and uh, facilities and exercise therapy and all so this is our open uh, even we have a uh, both uh, open yoga sessions and even a uh, and a closed yoga sessions and personal and individual training yoga sessions we directly go to the pay patient rooms and individual uh, uh, yoga taking also will be there uh, with us because few people may not be able to come down and uh, participate in a uh, group yoga so and coming to the kitchen and dining sessions where uh, we generally used to prefer uh, um, some site of a malt or sprouts uh, or boiled sprouts according to the necessity to, uh, to the patients and afternoon as like multi grain pulkas with uh, boiled curries to uh, to uh, to curries with uh, little amount of curd and uh, 
uh, all those things. All those are uh, perfectly salt-free diet. And the evening, we generally give to the patients uh, only the uh, fruit diet, uh, unless until they have some or the other uh, diseases that they have to have the food uh, due to the medication like diabetes or antidepressants like that. And coming to the our organization, so actually we have not uh, done a full-fledged kind of uh, research uh, like uh, no closed kind of research inclusion of exclusion criteria and all. It's just a overall observation of our uh, ROKLM since 2012 to January 2021. Uh, we have collected uh, <coughs> more than 14,000 data that is 14,247 since 2012. Of course, we have a lot of data because, because of early discharges or other I mean, missing of data. Uh, we didn't consider all those things and uh, reduce number of lack of uh, uh, no uh, number of duration of days is very reduced or so less all those things data we didn't consider we have considered like comorbidities or like dm hypertension pcod ra cvds etc and the data consists of 63.8 percentage of uh, females and 36.2 percentage of males Whereas uh, those people are uh, basically from 77 percentage uh, from the both Telugu states and uh, in Andhra Pradesh and in Telangana, 15 percent from the Karnataka and 4 percent from the other states of uh, India and 4 percent from the NRIs. Whereas the demographic distribution are like uh, 12 percentage of illiterates and 11 percentage of primary education, 21 percentage of secondary education, 7 percent of PUC are equaling or 42 percentage of graduates, 14 percent or post graduates and above by coming to the professions like 20 percent uh, housemakers, uh, 10 percent retired and government employees, 12 percent students, 13 percent private employees, 16 percent and so on. So the average uh, uh, weight of that 14,247 uh, data was 38 years around. Uh, all of the grades that when we see when we buy, uh, when I bifurcate the uh, grade wise uh, obesity like grade one grade two and grade three and overweight obesity all those things are uh, all the averages wages were like 38 to 39. So the minimum and maximum age I've considered like 80 years to 82 years and uh, uh, around 85 years. So this was a duration of that uh, that mass number of uh, people that have stayed in our ROKL line, like average duration was 18 days in uh, overweight and average duration of, in grade 1 is 19 days, grade 2 is 21 days and grade 3 is 24 days. Whereas minimum and maximum number of duration because few people as uh, Ravikans are told that uh, uh, there will be a lot of people who comes to our ROKL line with a morbid obesity like they may be like 120 kgs, 140, 160 kgs even. So, uh, in that context, what we uh, what we will do is generally we ask them to stay for longer time. Even they accept those things and they just try to adjust uh, uh, our customers' food and uh, our sort of patterns and naturopathy treatments and stay they they stay back for longer time. And uh, coming to the uh, generally what we so what we we used to do uh, for a patient when they comes to the uh, ROGLM first one or two days or three or four days, it depends upon the day, duration of stay. We make them to be on food and later we started giving the uh, fasting therapy. Uh, so the, as as required or as availability of their time or uh, the capability uh, of the doing fasting, they perform the fasting a number of days. Here we give 250 grams of honey uh, with four to five lemons uh, uh, while doing fasting in every day and uh, uh, as like uh, other protocols, other uh, things that need to be followed in the naturopathy uh, uh, community while doing fasting is same as usual. We, we also follow like uh, doing enemas or performing uh, reduced moderate uh, moderate the activity, performing uh, very uh, uh, no kind of such a kind of activity where they they have to sustain for a longer time in the fasting. Of course, if you see the minimum and maximum fasting days, uh, the few are zero. Why? Because uh, they might be having some or the other medications. They might be having uh, antidepressants or they might be having diabetes, all those things. So they are those people, those type of people may not be able to do fasting. 
so those people we just leave and uh, coming to the 55 45 those maximum days they will not do at a stretch they do in a intermittent kind of they do a uh, five days of fast then again they go for a uh, food for or uh, fruits or uh, kind of a, a juice juices di- juice diet for a while like uh, one week and then again they start uh, doing fasting the average duration of fasting was 6 days and the average duration of uh, their stay was 20 days overall all together so the bmi changes if you see the bmi changes that is the in different grades of obesity the bmi changes is 1.5 in a overweight and in grade 1 it is 1.8 and grade 2 it is 2.3 and grade 3 it is 2.9 uh, if you see that more uh, the morbid obesity people could able to reduce uh, very faster than the overweight persons and the uh, there is a n number that you can see in a uh, different uh, categories so this is a over uh, overweight uh, sorry weight uh, calculations weight changes so in overweight around the uh, 4 kg of weight they are reducing and in grade 1 it is was 4.9 in grade 2 it was 6 kg and grade 3 it was 7.5 or morbid obesity is 7.5 overall uh, results all the results are uh, highly significant the p value is 0.001 and uh, the average weight change was uh, 5.2 uh, across the grades and uh, these uh, th- the results was uh, uh, with a confidence interval of 95 percentage so this was same thing and uh, when we see the in between group changes there was a significant change between the uh, overweight and grade 2 grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 obesities that was a p value is 0.001 uh, where the the n number was 14 uh, 14 uh, sorry 1400 uh, 14247 and uh, coming to the uh, we have uh, underwent mean we have applied the anova uh, to get these results and uh, coming to the bottlenecks of practicing salt free diet see even though we practice the salt complete salt free diet we face a uh, one or two percentage of uh, uh, bottlenecks that means uh, uh, side effects of the salt free diet or you can say the uh, the difficulties of salt free diet that is mainly we we uh, observe like giddiness hyponatremia muscle weakness cramps spasms and alter sensorium sometimes due to uh, severe hyponatremia pro inflammatory pro inflammatory it is due to pro inflammatory effects loss of uh, energy drowsiness and fatigue of course we try to manage with a, a few sort of things that we generally give the lot of leaf vegetables to uh, maintain the sodium levels in the body and uh, give the coconut waters all those uh, type of managements will be applied even though if furtherly uh, if they are uh, uh, having a hyponatremia then we take uh, according to the necessity pressure uh, necessity sorry necessary precautionary measures and as well as uh, one more thing is just i want to indicate one more thing is that most of these 1% or 2% people uh, will be more than 80 sorry 60 years of age so less than 60 of years of age with salt free diet with 15 days or 20 days or 25 days or one month we will not find any sort of difficulties or any sort any sort of these uh, bottlenecks and at the same time uh only the those people who are uh, having this uh, uh, uh the side effects or the bottlenecks uh, salt free diet we try to change their medication we are try to alternate because they may be using di- long stand diuretics due to hypertension like hydrochlorothiazide or antidepressants or few of the steroids also um, increases the excretion of sodium so all those things will be managed uh, according to the necessity or according to the uh, uh, condition of the patient so with this i would like to uh, acknowledge all my team that supports me and uh, that give the data and arrange the data and uh, uh, i uh, once again thank the, uh, the ccryn for giving me this opportunity and uh, dr raghavendra sir for giving me this opportunity i once again thank to the uh, team members that arrange this conference and webinar uh thank you very much dr gnandev see uh, the way how you have explained the importance the significance of the salt and uh, even how it modulates the immune cells and even the macrophages even the pro inflammatory effect of it and even the gut microbiome also it was very exemplary the way how you because even in the detoxification procedure also the mechanisms which you have mentioned might have a very uh, um, prominent role in uh, getting getting the body detoxified 
Now, uh, as you, and one more thing, it's really yeah. a visual pleasure to look at your uh, hospital. It is really Thank good uh, to see all the sections I, and all everything. Yeah, yeah. So another thing is, uh, it's just a, a given information like uh, in your place, you will be giving the saltless diet and all. So yeah. before uh, uh, getting admitted of these patients, are you evaluating the baseline values of these salt for them? Because uh, sometimes what happens is even in the salt also, some people may be chronic hyponitromia ho sakte hain. And yes. there is a chance that they appear asymptomatic initially. So are you taking care on that issue? Yes, of course. They, when, whenever the patient uh, admitted on the second day itself, we evaluate about their sodium levels, uh, uh, in a, uh, how many millimoles that they have in a blood, uh, whether the, that is in a normal range or not. And every five days once we just cross examine all the people like with what sodium levels, whether there is any hyponatremia happens or not. But because out of our observations, a few times even hyponatremia, who it comes like, no, the normal levels is 135, minimum levels is 135, even though they come to 130 or 128, they may not be able to show any kind of symptoms because they are exactly. not, uh, they are not, uh, uh, the body may be able to sustain with mm. that. So to rule out those things, to avoid the, uh, uh, the consequences of the salt-free diet, we evaluate when they are in fasting, when they are in uh, other things. Uh, I mean, like uh, when we check the fasting insulin, uh, sorry, fasting sugar levels, all those things. Along with that, we try to check every time the uh, sodium potassium levels uh, in, of their uh, of the individuals. So according, if there is anything that we can suspect that these people, this person might be having this symptomatically few people. Yes, you are right. On the first day or the second day itself, sometimes they may be showing that uh, hyponatremia issues. But generally that happens 99.9% per, 99 we won't face that issue on the first day or the second day. But over a period of time, yes, we, we will face that issue like a 0 0.5 to, uh, sorry, 1 to uh, 2 percentage around. So uh, those things also we are, nowadays we are mitigating uh, by regular uh, look, uh, look about their uh, blood investigations. Okay. So immediately we will provide, if there is an hyponatremia, we immediately we will try to take necessary precautionary measures like providing the electrols or uh, mm. providing the coconut water and management, etc. managements. Okay. So another thing is like, for example, if the person stays for approximately 10 days or 21 days, for example, in your center using the salt-free diet. So yes. after once they come back home, once they start using the salt, will there be any difference in the threshold levels of that salt? Yes, uh, of course, because uh, in as the diet, taste, spe especially taste wise, I'm telling, especially yeah, the yeah, taste, taste wise. wise. That's what, that's what. Generally, uh, till now, uh, we have our taste, our uh, taste buds has been adopted to the uh, salt food. So yes. once once the taste buds is changed, the generally taste buds will change in within 10 days, right? So the regularly, it might be like 15 days sometimes. So anyway, they are going to stay at least for 15 to uh, 20 days or 30 days. Though, of course, their taste buds will get changed and they feel the extra salt that whenever they go back to home and they add as usual salt, they feel it is a very high salt. That means their uh, sensitivity might have been increased yes, to the yes, salt. Yes, so in yes. one way, it works so, very nicely, even in yes. future also. Even practically, they also can reduce the salt and they bring back their uh, daily salt consumption as per the RDA. Yeah. OK, that is or an important observation. Change, yeah, that, that they can change their uh, uh, habits to the uh, uh, other uh, thing also, like you know, rock salt or some of the other uh, alternatives. And okay. uh, generally our uh, followers who follows our system at home, even though they'll be continuously contacting us uh, uh, via doctors uh, for the consultation, for further consultations, they used to tell that uh, whatever the tips that we give it, give it to them, uh, because we teach them uh, cooking classes also, like how to cook uh, in, a, in a way that uh, salt taste has to be mitigated that uh, craving should be mitigated. So uh, those type of uh, observations, uh, those type of cooking methods they are following when they are following at home, of course, the salt sensitivity is so high, they required a hardly very less salt. Hmm. OK, that is a very good information that may help because the amount of salt will automatically get reduced yes. in future yes. after yes. leaving from that center because yes. all the time people can't stay in the centers and all. Yes. And the yes. way how you have explained the benefits of uh, reducing the salt or the salt free diet and the gut mi microbiome or endothelial dysfunction, that is really commendable. 
and it, it really stimulates the person to get a try on salt free diet or the saltless diet at least if these are the benefits of it and these were the mechanisms maybe research robust uh, research needs to be done but at least it is very convincing because once you find the results that gives an idea for the researchers to go for further research and what mechanisms it has been working yes. that is uh, very good that and i really really uh, thank you for this one and one more simple query i'm just asking you please, please. uh there is uh, once uh, somewhere i have read that if uh, fluid intake is more than 4 liters per day the person may there is a chance that the person may be uh, getting the hyponatremia condition so what is your share, uh, take on it yes of course that may be true in case of hyponatremia even we suggest to drink only uh, less than 3 liters of water uh, okay. in case of uh, in case of uh, there is a there is no hyponatremia we ask them to continue to drink for 4 liters or 4 and a half uh, and one more thing is generally we prescribe like 5 liters because uh, this weather the uh, weather in the vijayawada is very so hot so summer it may go to 48 also 48 degree centigrade yes. centigrade so generally we suggest like 5 liters because uh, there will be a lot of sweating when while doing uh, physical activity so in on that context we are suggesting around 4 4 liters in the winter and 5 liters around 4.5 to 5 liters are you not encountering summer. are you not encountering any hyponatremia in these conditions yeah uh, i mean in summer you are talking about yes no in that conditions uh, we just uh, go through regular uh, routine checkups right for every 3 days or 5 days once uh, sodium uh, sodium levels of their blood immediately we alert the patient and we give them the spinach juices or uh, spinach uh, uh, foods and all and okay. as well as we give the coconut water to replace the sodium levels even coconut is having a lot of yes. uh, sodium electrolytes so, and of course uh, electrolyte anyway the alternative we have the electrol packets is available so the patients can opt that okay okay so we have a very that safe precautionary measures yes yes so a very safe precautionary measures as well okay that is very nice and uh, i'm really thankful for the uh, really uh, knowledgeable the slides were very informative the the collection of the slides were very informative the way how you have explained is also really commendable and thank you very much dr gyandeep so now may i request uh, our director to please uh, Uh, switch on your audio sir if you are available i request uh, the director to just uh, come over for the vote of thanks Ma'am, you are on mute. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, you just tell me now. You have explained all these things, okay? Now, uh, with your clinical experience handling the obesity patients, and how are they following, and how are you able to just contain this one now? The conditions of obesity. How far? Just the uh, result part of it. Please unmute yourself. I may not. Didn't I unmute Do it? Doctor, Doctor Gandhi. acha acha okay so uh, one thing is like uh, out of my experience of course a uh, few of them will follow after going back home at least not like completely salt restricted with reduced amount of salt they may consume and as well as they may they will try to follow uh, the physical activity and uh, uh, the yoga or uh, other diet patterns that is calorie restricted diet and all so they will follow they will try to follow at least of course um we will get back a uh, few people like no uh, return back uh, uh, because of lack of uh, um, follow up I mean lack of follow up means they could not able to follow uh, so those things will be uh, uh, addressed actually but practically yes uh, we are seeing that there are lot many people are following okay so that is a good because at the individual level being a clinician you are you're doing your level best to help uh, mitigate this uh, yes. uh, problem of obesity Yes. Now I thank you very much, Dr. Kanyandi. Now may I request the director to please uh, uh, come forward of thanks. May I request Dr. Uh, director, Dr. Raghavendra, to please uh, switch on the hands. Yes. Oh. 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you for uh, being here and uh, half of the day and uh, spending your valuable time in discussing this very important issue of managing obesity. Uh, we got some several very good insights right from the use of yoga for managing obesity in the long term uh, to use of fasting and calorie restriction, to use of bariatric surgery, and to also regarding yoga and naturopathy principles in management of obesity, as well as on low salt diet. Why I looked at all these things is uh, just for the reason because obesity is becoming a very big problem today, and uh, we see more and more number of people flocking to yoga and naturopathy centers with a view of reducing weight. So we have looked at very extreme cases of morbid obesity with complications where they have been treated with bariatric surgery. But here I would like to say that we have seen such cases being also handled by yoga and naturopathy fraternity, where when you add on this along with their bariatric surgery, they do very well. So we have seen, uh, and I, uh, I think Dr. Ravikant himself sends his patients to MSR, Arogelam, I think so, and uh, for uh, taking, uh, reducing their, their diet and reducing some amount of body weight before they, he starts on surgery with those people. And uh, he has seen that the amount of rate of complications are very low in this, uh, in this population who take recourse to yoga and naturopathy treatment. Another thing which I would like to bring to your all attention is, uh, though we know that yoga and naturopathy is very useful, uh, in managing yoga, uh, useful managing obesity, we also seen a kind of a movement which is also happening in the community today. I don't know how many of you have heard about Fitter. Okay, Fitter is a group, a Facebook group which was started by Choksi, okay, Jitendra Choksi and his colleagues. So they were all fitness enthusiasts and they wanted to get uh, get get into shape. They're all IT professionals and they wanted to get into shape and they started this particular group which looked at reducing weight by using exercise as well as by using diet and it's a very very huge group on the community today on Facebook and uh, they even run courses on reducing weight and people who already lost weight by using following their diet as well as their fitness regimen they become teachers or uh, they become mentors to other new people who enter into the particular group it's a very interesting interesting concept which I saw and uh, this is really taking up the social media by storm in fact and a lot of work is happening in this particular field so we also have to look at developing ways and means, more scientific means and ways of looking at how do we manage obesity. Uh, is it just only by fasting? Is it only by looking at weight reduction by removing, removing excess salt uh, from your diet or by reducing the water load from your body, increasing diuresis? What is it? What is the mechanism exactly for a long term sustenance of somebody's weight? So is it possible that we can also alter the gut microbiome? OK, microbiota. And that change in the gut microbiota can also help in increasing your metabolism, can also reduce your weight. We don't know. There are a lot of questions which we need to ask and which we need to do, which we, which we really need to do. And in fact, uh, we are already speaking with certain uh, startup companies, like one of them is called Boxpeak, uh, which is the first uh, uh, microbiome company in India, started in 2014. And the researchers were also one of my colleagues in ISC. Okay. And uh, they are doing a whole genome data. DNA data, DNA sequencing of the stools, okay, and they are trying to find out the various kinds of bacteria, viruses, and other pathogens which are already there, and uh, they are trying to see what is the commonality in various disease conditions, and uh, how by replacing this or modifying this can it just lead to a change. So these are some interesting examples, I think, and I request all institutions to come forward and to participate in this. We are in fact trying to put a collaborative study, a multi-institutional collaborative study on this looking at gut microbial flora uh, in obese patients and how they are getting amenable by or changed by using yoga and aesthetic interventions over a long term. So this I think we can also take forward as a very big research study uh, to see uh, how this has got implications for our practice of yoga and aesthetic. So we need to bring more scientific paradigms into our understanding of obesity and how we can manage obesity or manage weight over a long term. So sustenance is a challenge here. You, we all can really lose 5 kg of weight in 10 days or 15 days, but how are you going to sustain this over long term? Okay, how are you really going to bring about a change in the physical appearance of a person over a long time? Long term, and these are some important uh, issues which we really need to address and uh, try to find the means and ways to uh, develop this kind of a uh, protocols. Okay, uniform protocols across all the centers. So we because we see that in major centers of uh, naturopathy, more than 50 to 60 percent of the patients are obese patients. So these are the ones who come and take recourse to interventions. So uh, they form a very huge chunk of 
our Nashpur interventions. So these are the people who need to be targeted and uh, with uh, adequate measures and we need to take these things forward. I uh, welcome all of you for being uh, here. Thankful to all of you for being here uh, for this half a day session on uh, yoga and Nashpur, the management of obesity and hope uh, we had different insights. We had insightful discussion into different aspects of obesity and its management and uh, you all had some amount of knowledge and take home message uh, and, and understanding about this problem in a more scientific manner than before. Uh, thank you all for being uh, with us. It was wonderful to have you here. We'll keep having more webinars every month and request all of you to join to these webinars and uh, look up at CCR and website and Facebook page uh, for these uh, announcement of these webinars. Thank you all once again. And thank you NC and the CCR and team for, for organizing this uh, very efficiently uh, and we'll be doing more such webinars and thank you so much. Have a thank good you day. very much sir. Thank you very much sir.